don't share the Zoom link to have them go to the YouTube link. Not that this is a case that folks are going to want to follow, but um, you just may have colleagues um, who are curious or need to stay plugged in. And so if they go to the court's website, there's this big link that talks about the video links. And this is now on. Can you hit the got it button? Stay, no one, stay muted and then got it. Thank you. All right. And we're not on the record yet. A reminder that this is a touch screen. Um, so the, the witness monitor is a touch screen. Um, so if you need a witness to circle something, I'll explain that. It's pretty simple to operate, but I'll just explain what they need to do. Um, you're also free to anecdote annotate using your own devices um, if you know how to do that. And you may not need anything annotated, but sometimes if there's an accident scene, well, where was your car? And the witness can, with his or her finger on the screen, draw a circle and it will show up on all the other screens. Um, last thing, and then um, we'll get on the record and bring the jurors in. Um, they're gonna be in the jury box. When you're addressing them, please don't get up close to them. Um, uh, just to respect COVID space. Um, you don't need to wear a mask when you're talking to the jury, um, but uh, I know some lawyers like to be near them. I'm gonna tell them that they need to wear their masks while they're in here because they're not gonna be talking. People who are talking are free to not wear masks. Um, I'm not requiring you to stay at the podium, but if you get too close, I'm gonna say you need to step back and that's just an awkward moment and I don't, want to create an awkward moment so just resist the temptation to be up close stay closer in the well to the the podium all right um let's get back on the record in chia versus santana a few things before we bring the jurors in number one um you all should um think about getting a court reporter for tomorrow and or thursday um, Ms. Rivers can cover tomorrow. We're only going in the afternoon, drug court in the morning. She would do that remotely, um, but she is quite capable of covering it remotely. She is not available on Thursday. I checked with her schedule. So if this is going to go into Thursday and it's something you want taken down, it might just be deliberations. Um, you'll need to provide a court reporter. I will not have one for you. So whether that's Mr. Williams's crack team getting on it um, with a different vendor, um, uh, tomorrow would be the earliest you might need it, um, and definitely on Thursday. Um, second, I said it once, but I want to reemphasize, please, Mr. Huntley, make sure that someone from your team reaches out to Dr. Pupala to let him know he's not talking about causation. And he, again, he may, may be reticent, so it's not going to come out unless you ask. Last thing, just logistically, and I'll tell the jurors when they're in here, um, I'm the presiding judge for this special purpose grand jury, the Trump grand jury, the attorney general is coming in to testify today. So I have to be on call if there is an issue where the district attorney's office asks questions of attorney general Carr to which he has an objection um, and they need someone to um, mediate that. I am he, and so we'll have to pause here. Um, Ms. Niles will come in and say, oh, there's an issue. Um, and we'll take a little break and I will need to figure out what the DA is trying to ask the AG that the AG doesn't want to ask. I apologize, Gerald. is that today and tomorrow or? All I know is today. I just got an email from the attorney general's lawyer um, asking how to navigate that. And I explained, reach out to Ms. Niles and we'll pause what we're doing here. I don't think they're going to be issues. The lawyer doesn't think they're going to be issues. He just wanted to know the mechanism. So that would be a reason that we have to have an emergency stop. Otherwise, I'm good all day. Okay. Mr. Huntley, anything else? And you're on the screen. I plan on using um, my camera for the jury. That's going to be there. You know, just look that way. When you say your camera, I don't know what I you mean. mean. Video. <coughs> presentation. Okay. Like you're going to have a PowerPoint? Correct. Okay. The big screen right there, um, and I think we can angle it a little bit, but that's for the jurors to see. Um, the jurors can see that as well. Because it didn't come up up there earlier. It only came on. 
That one. Oh, this one may be, um, we had hardwired it, I, I don't, but that one, it'll come up on. Yeah, that one did work. I okay. Just, that's why I asked because that one did not work. Okay. Um, what's on that screen? It's just, it just says Zoom. Oh. It's not locked. I wonder what, what, which one that is. And just to interject, is there a PowerPoint for your opening that you're going to do? Correct. Okay. I think we need to take a look at that before you, um, jumps into his opening, Your Honor, if there's anything in there that. I don't know what's in the opening on his PowerPoint. So. Well, if it's nothing about Dr. Papala talking about causation or exhibits that haven't been admitted, I don't know that it has to be just, I mean, I guess it's technically a demonstrative. Right. I mean, I just don't know what's on there. That's all. Correct. It's demonstrative evidence. That okay. If it's, uh, is there anything that you expect these lawyers to object to in it? None that I would expect them to see. How many slides is it? I mean, four. Okay. Just show them the four slides real quickly. Just put it up on the screen. Okay. Does that need to be angled at all? I don't know that it can be, but if you're sitting, that's probably a little better. Okay. For the jurors. No, no, I, the lawyers don't need to see it. They've got their own little monitors. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we thought we'd need to have you logged in on that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So the meeting ID is 931. Two three three two three nine nine one, and the passcode is seven one nine one six six. Yeah, that's all up here. So, those ones you are one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Right. Any issues? Um, I'm so I was assuming that they were going to introduce the photographs about uh, Mr. Ham. Yeah, now no no objections. Okay. All right. Assuming you are going to introduce the photographs, um, you should feel free to. Put that up. All right, um, Mr. Williams, anything before we bring the jury in? No, Your Honor. Mr. Ham? No, Your Honor. All right, let's bring him in, please. Your Honor, there is something up on this screen up there. I don't know if you can click on it to close it out. Let's see, whoever has the mouse can just go click on it close it so you can see. Yeah, I don't know how. We'll get our IT folks in here. You all can sit once you've found your special seat. You don't have to stay. We stand for you. You don't have to stand for us. Thank you, Deputy Gordon. The rest of you can be seated as well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to apologize for the delay. Um, we had, I think, almost all of you close to nine o'clock. Uh, at least one of you 
was misdirected by um, folks at the entrances to the seventh floor, which is where jurors used to meet when we picked jurors, juries in person. Um, but I appreciate everyone's effort um, in making your way down here. I hope you had a good three-day weekend, whether you celebrated Father's Day or Juneteenth or both. Um, we are about ready to get started in this case. We had to work through a couple of legal issues as well. Um, and uh, we uh, had to secure the services of my court reporter, Ms. Rivers. Um, she was going to be doing something else, but the scheduled court reporter is part of the great resignation and decided not to show up today. Um, and so um, Ms. Rivers is pinch hitting and we're grateful to her for that. Um, we are going to be hearing from the lawyers and some witnesses in the case of Chia versus Santana, which you all heard a little bit about virtually. It's nice to actually see you in person rather than on a screen. Um, each day we'll be together. Well, I won't say each day because tomorrow's going to be different. Today we're together till about five. Um, we'll take regular breaks. You've already had a healthy break. Um, but anytime you all need a break because it's hard to hear, you just need to refocus, whatever it is, raise your hand, let me know, and we'll pause for as long as you need to pause. Um, we'll have uh, a lunch break um, in probably a couple hours. I'd like us to get some of the case under our belts before we do that. But my main message to you all is if you've been sitting for too long and you need a break, let me know because your primary role here is gonna be listening and watching um, what the witnesses tell you about what happened in this case. They'll be sitting right there. You'll also see them well, on that screen. We're trying to get the screen higher up to work as well. Someone from IT will be here soon. Um, but uh, your main role will be listening to that evidence um, and deciding what happened in this case. I have some basic legal instructions I need to give you, but before I can do that, I need to give you a second oath. Uh, on Friday, you took the voir dire oath where you promised to give truthful answers to the many questions we asked you. Um, this is the juror oath that I'm gonna administer where you swear or affirm that, that you will um, fairly try this case. So I know you just got seated, but I'm gonna ask you all to stand up and raise your right hand, and then you can get back in those comfortable chairs. We're all there, right hand up. Excellent. Do you swear or affirm that you shall well and truly try this case and a true verdict give according to the law that I provide in the opinion that you form concerning the evidence presented to you and that you will do so to the best of your skill and knowledge without favor or affection to either party. Please say yes, if you so swear or affirm. Yes. Great. What's on the screen, you guys? You can sit down. You keep looking at this. Is something funny happening on the screen? Oh, it's working? Holy smokes. Okay. Look at that. Way to go, IT. Remote fix. All right, good. Should be the same thing on both screens. If it's not, raise your hand. All right. Um, if at any time during the trial you cannot hear what's going on, if a witness is speaking too softly, if one of these screens goes blank and you're trying to read what's on it, let me know. Um, we do not replay witness testimony. When you're back there deliberating, you will not get a transcript of what witnesses have to say. So it's important that in the moment, if you aren't able to see or hear, um, you pause us so that we can get someone to speak up or we turn the volume up or we do whatever we need to do. A couple of housekeeping things, and then I'll give you um, the legal instructions. First, masks. Um, I have instructed the lawyers, because they will be speaking, that they don't need to wear their masks because they may need to speak at any moment. They can stand up and object, et cetera. I won't be doing a whole lot of talking other than right now and at the end of the trial, so I'll put my mask back on. Um, you all need to wear your masks while you're in here. What you do in the jury room, that's a private space, and you guys can reach your own accommodation as to what you do in the jury room. Most importantly, when you're out in the public space, Masks are required and deputies will stop you and fuss at you if you're not wearing a mask. So important to comply with that. Um, second has to do with these notepads. You are free to take notes. You are not required to take notes. Note taking is an opportunity, um, but not an obligation. 
Um, but remember what I said, that you will not get a recording or a transcript of what the witnesses said. So if there's something that seems noteworthy to you and you want to jot it down, you should do so. Your notes should remain private until you begin your deliberation. So your thoughts or your doodles or your sketches that you're making, um, they stay just with you until you start your deliberations. When you do deliberate, meaning the jurors all talk about what they think this case is about and what one side proved or the other did, you're free to look to your notes, but you should not give your notes any more precedent than your independent recollection. So just because a colleague may have written down the light was red, but you are certain that the witness said the light was green, then you're gonna decide maybe someone wrote the wrong thing down. But the trial is gonna take a little while and it can't hurt if you want to, to jot some things down. When the trial is over, we will shred your notes. You don't need to worry that they're gonna show up on the Drudge Report or anything like that. I don't read them. Um, someone on my staff tears out those pages and they literally get shredded um, in a back room. Um, but please don't share your notes with anyone until you begin your deliberations. And if you run out of paper, we can get you another pad. Um, and if you need another, it, it just turned on. I don't know what you did. This is the IT guy. It's Mr. Lagan. Hi, Mr. Lagan. Um, but this screen, um, it was something else and now it's on. Okay. So good work. I don't know if you just did one of these things that you do, but yeah. yeah. All, right. All right. We'll call again when there's the next issue. Okay. Appreciate it. Mystery. Sometimes all we have to do is send the email saying it's not working and then it fixes itself. Um, don't get distracted by note taking. Um, some folks, they, they're channeling their college or their high school days. And I'm going to write down every single word. Um, it's important that you watch the witnesses from time to time as well. One of your responsibilities is to determine the credibility or believability of the witnesses. And some people do that just by listening. But some people are, hey, you know what? When he was answering questions from one side, he was all smiles. And the moment the other side started asking questions, he's sweating, he's not making eye contact. And that may suggest something to you about that witness's credibility, but it will only suggest something to you if you take a look at that witness. If you are buried in the notes that you're taking, you're gonna miss that kind of stuff. So I'm not discouraging you from doing it, but don't let the note taking become all consuming. Um, quickly on scheduling, tomorrow we are not going to start till one o'clock. Um, I will not tell your employers that. Um, so you do what you do in the morning. Um, but I'm one of the drug court judges and clients come in every two weeks. We got to help them work through their issues. You're welcome to come early and watch drug court. You can sit out there. Um, but I'm not expecting the lawyers and witnesses to be ready to go until one tomorrow. Um, we'll go all day today, but tomorrow we start at one. So ideally, if you all can stay till six, if we're still going, and we may be done before then, your normal commitment is nine to five, but because we're not starting until one, um, if you can stay until six, that would be great. You don't need to tell me now. We'll work through that at the end of today when I remind you when to be here tomorrow. Um, if we go into Thursday, I don't know that we will, but if we do, we're back to let's be here in the morning and we'll go as long as you need to go. Um, but the lawyers don't think the case will necessarily go that long. Although we thought we'd have a court reporter here on time that they had scheduled and a couple other issues that came up. So we're, we're running a little bit behind. Let me talk to you now a little bit about the law that you must apply and a little bit about what to expect um, in a civil trial like this. You all are about to hear the case of Therese Chia versus Dania Rio Santana. You met Mr. Chia briefly before. He's the gentleman seated at the table with Mr. Huntley. Ms. Santana was not present for jury selection, didn't need to be, nothing wrong with that. But she's seated at council table with Mr. Williams and Mr. Ham. Before we begin the trial, I need to talk to you a little bit about the law, your role as jurors, my role as judge, and the lawyer's roles as advocates for their clients. Most of you, as I recall from jury selection, have not served on a jury before. And so your understanding of what it's like is from watching TV and you're used to you know, a lawyer pounding and someone cries, yes, I did it, I killed my husband. That's not going to happen in this case. There's not going to be this sudden breakdown of a witness and then this let off in handcuffs, case closed or anything like that. Um, it's not going to be like that, um, but um, we're going to talk about how you'll conduct yourself, what I'm going to do, et cetera. 
Um, we've talked about note taking. So in a civil case, it is the plaintiff, that would be Mr. Chia as represented by Mr. Huntley, who has the burden of proof. Mr. Chia through his lawyer needs to prove his case. And his burden is known as a preponderance of the evidence. You may have heard from TV beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a criminal case. That's not this case. The term preponderance means superiority in weight. And what it means in the context of a civil case is the greater weight of evidence upon the issues involved. To be a preponderance, the weight of the evidence must be sufficient to incline a reasonable and impartial mind, those are your minds, to one side of the issue rather than the other. And here's where that image of the scales of justice actually applies real helpfully. A preponderance of the evidence means if you stack up all the evidence after you've considered it and you find that the scales are leaning perceptibly, don't have to be like this, that's your beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you feel like the evidence leans ever so slightly, in Mr. Chia's favor, that's a preponderance of the evidence and he will have met his burden. If you find that the scales don't move at all, that it is even, Mr. Chia has not met his burden because you're not leaning in one way or the other. Defense wins if it's 50-50. If the scales are leaning perceptibly in the direction of the defense, Mr. Chia has not met his burden because you find that actually the preponderance of the evidence is in the defense's direction. That's the burden of proof in this case. It's not to the one yard line, anything like that. It's, it's um, simply getting those scales to tilt in Mr. Chia's favor. The basic structure of a trial is that in a few moments, I'll be quiet and the attorneys will have an opportunity to give what we call opening statements. What the attorneys tell you in an opening statement is a preview or forecast of what they think the evidence will be. It is not evidence. In fact, Nothing, nothing the lawyers say is evidence in this case. Evidence is going to come in two forms. What a witness says, who's been sworn in to tell the truth, and then exhibits. There may be medical records or photographs, anything that I admit as evidence. Those are the two things you consider to decide if Mr. Chia has proven his case by a preponderance. What the witnesses say and any physical evidence that's admitted not what the lawyers say. So the lawyers are going to give their openings and tell you what they think this case is about and what the evidence will show or what it will fail to show. When the openings are done, Mr. Huntley will get up and begin to present his client's case. And he'll do that by calling witnesses and tendering evidence. When Mr. Huntley is done, I'll say, call your next witness. Judge, plaintiff rests. That will be the close of the plaintiff's case. At that point, We'll need to take a break because there'll be some motions I need to hear from both sides. And when we keep going, then the defense will have the very same opportunity. These lawyers will have a chance to call witnesses and tender evidence. And at some point, I'll say, Mr. Williams, Mr. Ham, call your next witness. They'll say, Judge, the defense rests. And then the evidence is closed. You will have heard all the testimony. You will have received all the exhibits that you're going to get in order to make your decision about which side has proven its case, or really has Mr. Chia met his burden of proving his case by a preponderance. Once the evidence is closed, both sides have rested, the attorneys get a chance to get back in front of you and make what we call closing arguments or summations. That's when the lawyers will argue to you, not with you, hey, this is what the evidence has shown or what it's failed to show. My client has demonstrated this. He has failed to demonstrate that. But remember, nothing the lawyers say to you is evidence. If the lawyers talk till they're blue in the face that it was rainy that day, and so who could tell which car hit what car? And you think the evidence was that it was sunny out. It was sunny out. It's not what the lawyers tell you. It's what you conclude from your review of witness testimony and the evidence that is admitted. When the lawyers are done with their efforts to persuade you, which they're free to do, to decide the case in their favor, then I will give you a little more on the law that you have to apply to the facts that you find, and you'll be off and running, deliberating. You'll go back in the jury room, you'll have the exhibits with you, and you will decide how this case ought to resolve. 
During the trial, both sides are free to object to the admission of evidence, either object to an, a document coming in or objecting to a question that's asked if they feel that its admission would violate one of the many rules of evidence. And I have to rule on those objections. So the lawyers are doing their job when they say objection, hearsay. I'm doing my job when I say sustained or overruled. You must consider only the evidence that is admitted during the trial. So it will sometimes occur that a witness starts answering a question, a lawyer objects, says, judge, move to strike. If I tell you to disregard what that witness said, you actually need to do that. If you wrote it down, cross it out. And if you remember during your deliberations, when one of your colleagues says, hey, remember that witness who said um, he saw the police arrive on scene 10 minutes later? And that was something that for whatever reason I said, you need to disregard that disregard what time the police arrived on scene. You need to police that and say, hey, that was one of the things the judge said we're not supposed to pay attention to. So yeah, she said it took 10 minutes for the police to get there, but we're not supposed to pay attention to that. The good news is that happens very infrequently because it's kind of an unfair exercise for you all to say, forget what you just heard. But if I say it, I mean it, and you need to disregard it. Every once in a while, the lawyers will say, they may say, um, not I object, but judge, I have a motion. And that usually means you get a bonus break because a motion involves the lawyers needing to talk about things outside your presence. Maybe they know what's about to come and they think it shouldn't come in. And they say, judge, I think this witness is gonna say A, B, and C, but I don't think it should come in. Well, you shouldn't hear A, B, and C if that lawyer is right. I try to get these lawyers to talk to me about motions after you leave for the day and before you get here. We actually did start early. Um, but because of the court reporter issue, we couldn't make a record of the things they wanted to talk about. Nothing that I say in making any ruling on a motion or objection should be deemed by view by you as me having any view on who's doing a better job, on which side ought to prevail, on whether or not the plaintiff has made its case by a preponderance or not. I'm simply ruling on an objection, applying the law as I understand it to the situation before me. My role in this case is simply to make sure that it is fairly tried according to the rules of evidence and the law of Georgia and nothing else. Your job is to decide what happened in this case. What are the facts of this case? Was Mr. Chia injured? What are the extent of his injuries and should he recover anything? You'll do that by hearing the testimony, accepting the exhibits, and then deliberating. You will necessarily, in doing all this, be determining the credibility or believability of the witnesses that testify. You decide which witnesses to believe and which not to believe. If there are any that you don't believe, it may be that you're able to believe everything you hear and you can resolve any conflicts through some other means. In determining credibility or believability, you're free to consider all of the facts and circumstances of this case, the manner in which the witness testified. Remember I mentioned, don't get buried in your notes, but look at how witnesses are reacting to lawyers and questions. Your sense of the witness's intelligence or knowledge of the subject about which the witness is testifying. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the case, we call that bias and the means and opportunity that the witness had for knowing the things about which she's testifying. You are free to believe or disbelieve all or any part of the testimony of any witness. You decide what is worthy of belief and what is not. Now, in deciding the facts of this case, you may from time to time determine that there are conflicts in the evidence. One person said he went left, another person said he went right. If you do find conflicts in the evidence, you should try to resolve the conflicts as if each witness had spoken the truth. Very often, one person will see an incident very differently from someone else because maybe they're standing on opposite sides of an intersection. It doesn't mean that one person is being untruthful. It simply means that people's recollections or perspectives are different. But if you do find that some part of the evidence is in such conflict, is to make it impossible for you to reconcile them, then you should believe the evidence that seems most reasonable, probable, and truthful to you. 
During trial, at the conclusion of each witness's testimony, you'll be given an opportunity to submit questions of your own. Normally, it's the lawyers who ask all the questions, but every once in a while, when a witness is done testifying, you're left with a question or questions that were not answered. There are note cards there in front of um, one of the jurors, and we're going to get more out there because you should each have five or six note cards with you at all times. And the way you get your question presented is by writing it down on the note card. So when we're all done with witness number one, I'll ask you all to take a moment to write down any questions if you have them, and you don't ever have to ask a question. But if you have one, you write it down on the note card. You don't have to put your name on it. Just, hey, what color was the guy's shirt? That was the question. What color was the guy's shirt? You write it down. Your questions will be collected by our deputy, who's not in here right now. Um, he'll give them to me. I'll look at them and I'll share them with the lawyers. And if your questions are proper questions, I will ask them of the witness. So you won't end up saying anything, but you'll know, hey, that was my question. And the witness will answer the question. You should draw no conclusion from the fact that your question is not asked. Just like a lawyer can ask a question that prompts another lawyer to say, objection, and then I sustain it. In other words, bad question, doesn't get asked. You could write down a question that unknowingly is an objectionable question. And I'll be filtering them that way. So if you asked a question that causes a witness to speculate, well, why do you think this happened? That might be a question that's improper. I won't tell you it's improper. I just will not ask the witness that question. The only evidence is what a witness says in the end. So if your question doesn't get asked, don't draw a conclusion that, oh, I was getting into a sensitive area, which means it was not a legally proper question. It's what the witnesses say that is evidence, not the questions that are posed. You must decide this case, and I'm going to repeat this every time we take a break, only on the testimony that you have in court and the exhibits you receive in court. A corollary of that means no outside research. So during break, please don't get on your phone and type in, hey, what, what does that intersection at Howell Mill and I-75 look like? If it is important to the lawyers in making their case for you to see or hear something, then they're going to share it with you. And you get to ask questions. And so if the lawyers didn't cover something that's important to you, write it down on a note card. But do not conduct outside research. Don't Google a term. If there's a doctor who testifies and that doctor uses some complicated medical term and doesn't make sense to you, ask. I'm going to. Doc, you just use the child. Do not know what that means. You can write it down and we'll have the doctor put it in layperson terms so we can all understand it. What would be inappropriate would be to look it up online. If that happens and I learn about it, we may have to do this trial all over again which isn't fun for anyone, you won't serve as jurors, but the juror who Googled it will get to watch the trial from back there. That'll be even less fun. So please don't do it. Um, the lawyers have a right, the parties have a right to have this case decided only on what gets presented here in court. And it's a real simple reason. There's nothing wrong with being curious, but you might look at something online and get half the answer. And the lawyers have a chance to flesh that out. So one lawyer may say, well, tell me about what happened to the left side of the car. Oh, my gosh, look at what happened to the left side of the car. Well, the other side gets a chance to say, well, what happened to the right side of the car? And then you hear that and say, oh, this is not such a big deal. If you're looking at something online, no one gets a chance to explore with you the significance of what you researched. End of sermon, but please don't do that. Last point, um, and this, this may seem a little counterintuitive because you're working on this case together, but it is important that until all the witnesses have testified, and I've given you the law that you have to apply to this case, that you don't start deliberating. So during lunch, you're free to eat with each other. You don't have to be separate, but don't already start, oh my gosh, based on what I've heard so far, this one's a slam dunk for one side or the other. You haven't heard everything yet. And most of all, you don't even know the law that you have to apply to the facts. So resist that urge to talk about this case with each other. You'll get as much time as you need to deliberate. There are no time limits on deliberations. Um, that also means that you shouldn't talk with people outside this group about this. So when you go home today, um, someone's going to say, whether it's a significant other or your pet or your plant, hey, how'd it go? How'd it go? The answer is that judge is a great guy, but I can't talk to you about anything else because your well-meaning other person is going to say, oh, did one of the lawyers do this thing? Because let me tell you, when that happens, this is what it means. And they're going to be wrong because that's not this case. And they had a different experience. 
So it's almost like um, from that who wants to be a millionaire, instead of doing the research, you're doing the friend line. When you tell someone about, about what you're doing, they're going to want to tell you about their experience. Oh, I had this situation. I was rear-ended. That's fascinating, but that's not this case. So until the trial is over, you need to be real, real discreet about what you're doing. You may have needed to tell an employer or loved ones, hey, I'm in a trial, but just leave it at that. Don't tell them what it's about because they're going to want to give you their two cents and they don't get to do that. When this trial is over, if you want to write a book about it, if you want to run down the street telling people what it was all about, you can do that and you can field questions from other people. But until then, uh, we want to keep you focused on the facts and circumstances of this case and not someone else's. Remember, if you need a break, let me know. Otherwise, we'll probably go till about lunchtime and I'm done talking with you. I'm going to ask Mr. Huntley if he wants to give an opening statement. Yes, sir. Then now's the time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As John stated, I'm attorney Buddy Huntley. Yes, Buddy, BQD, get it all the time. It is my name. And I have the honor of representing Mr. Therese Chia here. You kind of already heard about the case, um, but, but I'm going to give you some more details about it. But before we get started, I want to thank you all for being here today. You're serving a very important role in this process, and I'm sure there's a million other places you'd rather be than sitting here listening to me drag on and on about how my client is formed. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I'm going to try to streamline this process and make this an easy decision for you. So thank you once again. I, I can't express that enough. Now, although I'm keeping it streamlined, bear with me because it will take some time. We have some witnesses. I'm going to have to do my job to present the case so that you will believe me and so I will be fine. But before we get into that, as I was preparing for this case, I thought about a story. And it's really a lesson that was taught to me by my grandmother. And what happened? I was out playing with friends in the Super Bowl, you know, as all kids do in the playing bar. I was a quarterback. We're in the fourth quarter. We're about to win the game. I drop back. I throw a pass and hits no one except the neighbor's car. Shatters the window. All of a sudden, guess what I have? No friends. Everybody goes home. I go inside, I talk to my grandmother. Say, you know, it's a mistake. I didn't, I didn't mean to do it, you know? It happens, right? She says, yes. However, when you make mistakes, you have to be held accountable for those mistakes. So, needless to say, that summer, I was on grass weekly. Not a fun experience, but it did taught me something. It taught me about accountability and responsibility. And that's exactly what this case is about. This isn't a difficult case. It's not a complicated case. It's about being accountable and being responsible. We know mistakes happen. And in this case, this mistake happened. Mr. Chia, was stopped at a red light when he was rear-ended by the defendant, Miss Santana. Now, Miss Santana is why we are here today. You know, she doesn't want to be held accountable and she wants to avoid the responsibilities of the damages she has caused. Or at a minimum, she wants to get a discount on the harm she's caused to Mr. Chi. Now, the rules of the road, these are all rules we're familiar with. Don't follow too close and keep a safe distance. Why do we do that? So we can avoid mistakes. When you don't do that, you end up running into someone because you might not be paying attention. Now, the evidence is gonna show, and you may or may not hear from this in terms, um, but she was driving and she has her two kids in the car, a one-year-old and a five-year-old. Now, if anyone has kids or nephews, nieces, or has dealt with a toddler, you know how much of a distraction they can be. 
So you have to pay attention and look at it. And you also have to be able to stop and have enough space before you run into somebody. Now, we talked about Mr. Chia and we showed you this. The second part of that story is that you're going to hear from Mr. Chia, who was driving this vehicle. And at the time he was driving this vehicle, he was working for Lyft. Not only was he working for Lyft, but he was carrying a passenger at the time of the accident. There would be no reason for Mr. Chia to want to cause an accident while you're actively on a job. Now, once again, I don't know what story you'll hear from Ms. Santana, but originally she stated that Mr. Chia stopped intentionally so that he could run into the back of her. Now, during the course of this trial, when you hear from the witnesses, you hear from the evidence, I want you to think to yourself, does that make sense? Why would Mr. Chia stop and try to cause an accident? Now, after the accident, which occurred on May 6th of 2020, some time ago, Mr. Chia had complaints of injury. He had headaches, neck ache, and back ache. So the accident occurred on, like I said, May 5th. On May 6th, Mr. Chia goes and he actively treats, seeks treatment for his injury at a medical facility called AICA, A-I-C-A. And it was at that facility that he was able to receive treatment for his neck ache, back ache, and headache. He also received, you'll come to find out, an injection. However, that did not resolve all of his issues. Um, Mr. Chia had that treatment from roughly May through August of 2020. At that time, Mr. Chia was not able to work or lift because he was unable to sit for prolonged periods of time. And his vehicle, as you can see, was totaled. Now, that was May 2020. In August of 2020, Mr. Chia, the evidence will show, was provide, involved in a second accident. Now, this second accident was not as severe as the first accident. And what you're going to hear from Mr. Chia is that he was never fully recovered from the first accident. And this second accident made his injuries worse. We plan to allow you to hear from Mr. Chia as well as his treating physician um, about the extent of his injuries. Now, looking at this, and when you hear from Mr. Cheer, you're going to realize that first accident was a very impactful accident, whereas the second accident was more minor. But you'll have to listen to Mr. Cheer. He's going to explain to you the difference, not only the difference in the accidents, but the difference in the pain levels that he suffered because of the accidents. It's going to be very important for you all to understand that this second accident was not new. He was already injured in May in the accident with Ms. Santana. Now let's talk about a few things the evidence will not show. It's not going to show that the medical treatment Mr. Chia received wasn't reasonable and or necessary. It's not going to show that Mr. Chia did not suffer from any pain and or harm from this May accident, as well as the second accident. Mr. Chia is not going to come and tell you that, you know, that didn't affect me in any way, but he's going to let you know that it was an exacerbation of that first accident um, and those injuries were made worse. The other thing you're going to not going to hear is that Mr. Chia didn't miss time from work because of this accident. It's going to clearly indicate that from May of 2020 through August 
of 2020 that Mr. Chia was unable to work. You're going to get to see Mr. Chia's tax returns, and you're going to have an opportunity to look at exactly what he was earning the year before in 2019 and what he actually earned in 2020 to establish how much wages that he lost. Now, coincidentally, Mr. Chia had just begun working again in August of 2020 when he was involved in the second accident. And you'll hear from Mr. Chia an explanation of you know, why he went back to work, even though he was still in pain at the time. So after we prove all of these things, as the judge stated, I won't get to talk to you again. The next time I talk to you, I'm going to ask you to compensate Mr. Chi for his medical expenses, his pain and suffering, his lost wages, and his future lost wages. Now, this isn't uh, one of those who done it cases, like the judge said earlier, and it's not a $10 million case. However, this case is worth more than $1 million, which is what I will be asking you for to compensate Mr. Chia in the end. Now, keep in mind, when I ask you for this amount, what we're here to do is to determine what amount of money will make Mr. Chia whole. Not whether Mr. Santana can pay, whether Mr. Santana should pay, but we're trying to find the number that's going to compensate Mr. Chia to make him whole. I do appreciate your time and your attention, and I'm looking forward to presenting my case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. Gentlemen on the defense, have you decided in which order you're going to go and if either of you is going to give an opening? Not required to, but I want to give you the opportunity. Your Honor, I will give the opening statement. The sole opening statement. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The collective opening statement. Yes. Excellent. Mr. Hamm, when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Roosevelt Hamm, Jr. We met on Friday. Um, you also met co counsel, Mr. Brian Williams, who, and we are both representing Danya Santana. You did not see Ms. Santana on Friday. She was not present in the courtroom, but she is here today. And we have the pleasure and opportunity to represent her in this case filed against her by Mr. Chia. As you've heard, uh, this case is based on an accident that occurred during May of 2020, and specifically on May 5th, at the intersection of the uh, off-ramp of Interstate 75 northbound at Howell Mill Road. And this, this case is based on an accident that occurred when uh, Ms. Santana rear-ended the vehicle driven by Mr. Chia. Mr. Chia was stopped at a red light. Uh, Ms. Santana rear-ended rear him and caused the damage that you saw on the display shown to you earlier. The issues in this case are not are, are if Mr. Chia is entitled to any compensation from uh, Ms. Santana in, in what amount. Um, you will hear evidence that Mr. Chia went to, and I don't know the pronunciation of this has been called ACA, it's been called ACA. It's a facility that treats people who have been in automobile accidents for neck and back complaints. In fact, Mr. Chia had a complaint of neck pain, headaches, and lower back pain. He received treatment for about a two month period and was released from care around June, late June or early August of 2020. After numerous treatments and after an injection that was administered to him for lower back pain, he your evidence that Mr. Chia told the people at AICA or ACA that he was feeling better as a result of the treatment, that his pain levels had reduced, uh, and that, uh, as a matter of fact, after his injections, his, his back pain was at a level of one on scale of zero to 10, zero being low pain, 10 being excruciating pain. And then Mr. Chia had an accident during August of 2020, 
and he had the accident with a person unrelated to Miss Santana or anyone else involved in the case until that time. On August the 25th of 2020, Mr. Chia had an accident with Mr. Asmiel, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Caceres. This accident happened on, uh, at the intersection of Moreland Avenue and I believe United Way or United Avenue in the city of Atlanta. Uh, Mr. Chia was, I believe, driving southbound on Moreland Avenue. Uh, Mr. Caceres was driving northbound and Mr. Caceres was finally turned left in front of Mr. Chia. Mr. Chia hit the uh, right rear port panel of Mr. Caceres' vehicle. Um, and so Mr. Chia uh, renewed his uh, complaint of neck and back pain after the accident with Mr. Caceres. And his renewed complaints resulted in more treatment. Um, uh, so it is, there is a possibility that you will hear, and you may have heard that Mr. Chia says that Ms. Santana is responsible for her accident and that she is responsible for any ongoing difficulties caused by other events. That is namely the accident with Mr. Caceres several months after she had the accident with Mr. Chia. Uh, we expect the evidence to show that Mr. Chia was getting better after his accident with Ms. Uh, Santana, that he has stopped his treatment. He had the opportunity to go back to a AICA or ACA orthopedics if he felt it was necessary when he was released from his care, when he was released from their care. Uh, we expect the evidence to show that he did not return to them uh, until this accident on August the 25th of 2020. And his treatment was different after this accident than it was before the accident uh, with Ms. Santana. So if there's any responsibility for any accident, Ms. Santana would have the responsibility for the accident that she caused during May 5th of 2020. But we would also argue that Ms. Santana cannot and is not responsible for any accident or any event that happens to Mr. Chia after that date, since she was not involved in any other event with him. And that in fact, Mr. Caceres was responsible for causing the accident on August the 25th of 2020. And she'll be responsible for any damages arising from that accident. Uh, you know, what you have to show, what you have to determine as a jury is whether uh, the accident with uh, Miss Santana, or re let me rephrase that. Uh, if, if the accident that Mr. Cheer had with Miss uh, Santana approximately caused any damages beyond the period of time for which he received treatment for her accident. In other words, if Mr. Chia is trying to prove that Ms. Santana is, is responsible for any damages, any injury, any discomfort, any renewed pain beyond the time that Mr. Chia stopped his treatment with AICA, uh, we would say that he is incorrect in that assumption and cannot prove his case. And the issue of damages is what you will have to determine as to what Mr. Chia may be entitled to from Ms. Santana. Is, is he entitled to any damages based on his treatment and his lost wages or claims of lost wages from the period of time from May to August of 2020? Or is he entitled to any damages from May to infinity? from Ms. Santana. We would argue that if there are any damages to which Mr. Chia is entitled, he is only entitled from Ms. Santana for the period of time for which he received treatment. If he can prove that he was injured from the accident with Ms. Santana and to what degree. 
In other words, Ms. Santana, we would say, is not responsible for any and all injuries that she may have caused from the accident on May 5th, 2020. So we would ask that you listen to all the witnesses carefully. Look at all the evidence that you see on the screen and, and scrutinize it. And we would have the opportunity after the close of the evidence to come back and speak with you again. Please forgive me for my rescue voice. I, and I'm going to ask you for your patience when uh, I uh, ask questions of these witnesses in this matter. I have an analogy that's affecting me in this process. So I would ask that you listen carefully, look carefully, evaluate carefully, and at the close of the evidence, we will come to you and ask you to look at this evidence and decide in, in a manner favorable and fairly to Ms. Santana as well as Mr. Chia. So thank you for your time and attention in advance. Um, we want to thank you for any decisions that you make in favor of either part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ham. We are now ready for plaintiff's first witness. And we will call Mr. Chia. All right, Mr. Chia, if you come on up to the witness stand, please. The chair does not have wheels, so you have to really heave it to move it. My name is Tay is a chair. So first, before you go any further, um, take a seat and um, slide the seat so you're up close to that microphone, please. You can move the microphone. There you go. But you're going to need to get up close to it so it can pick up your voice. And if you don't mind, you've already done it. If you keep your mask off, um, people will be able to hear you better um, as long as you're comfortable with that. Okay. All right. So if you could state your name and spell your first and last name again, please. My name is Therese Chia. The first name is spelled T-E-R-E-S-E. Last name, C-H-I-A. Perfect. Thank you. And good morning, Mr. Chia. Can you tell the jury a little about yourself? Where are you from? History? Okay. I'm originally from Nigeria. So Nigeria is a country in uh, Africa. And um, I was born in Kaduna in 1958. August 1958. So Kaduna State is one of the states. Uh, located so I'm going to have him fast forward. Maybe not. We don't need to get into childhood. Uh, maybe we could get to adulthood 2020. Well, and let's do this. Mr. Chia, can you explain to the jury? How did you come to the United States from Nigeria? OK. First of all, I, uh, yeah. I finished my high school in Nigeria. I went to a government technical college. So during my final year, I applied to uh, schools in uh, overseas. So I had some admission in the, in the US here and also in the United Kingdom. So I got admitted at uh, Wisdom College of Technology, London in uh, 1980 for a higher national diploma program. So I went to London and uh, took up that program, which uh, lasted uh, six years. At the end of six years, I obtained my national higher diploma in mechanical and production engineering. So during that time, um, okay, I'm married. I have a wife and uh, a boy and a girl. So during that, uh, our stay in London, we used to visit friends here in Atlanta, Georgia. So we liked what we see. So we decided to move down here to improve our lives and the lives of our children. Uh, that was in 2004. So when we came down here, we brought some of our savings. So the friends that we met here, he was um, 
a dealer in uh, used cars. So he buys cars from the auction and so, so I decided to join him to do the same business. At the same time, I was looking for you know, full-time employment. So I believe in uh, 2005, I got um, employed by a company called uh, Computer, Generate, uh, Computer Generated Systems. So this company <coughs> represents uh, IBM in uh, repairing their computers. So all IBM machines were supported by uh, computer generated solutions. So I was employed as a technical representative. So part of my main job was to assist clients or customers when they call in with any issues they have on their, uh, with their computers. So if I'm not able to repair their computers over the phone, I'll send a field technician to go to their location and fix that. So while I was also working, I was also going to dealer auctions to buy cars and sell. So I was doing that on the side. Are we getting close to 2020 now? We're coming up to it. Okay. And, and Mr. Chia, can you tell the jury what you were doing for work in 2019? So in 2019, I was uh, driving for Lyft. So part of the main job driving for Lyft is uh, you assign jobs, uh, you go to uh, the customer location, uh, pick the customer up and drop them at their uh, final destination. And Mr. Shia, can you tell the jury how old are you? I'm 63 years old. And during the course of your lifetime, how many car accidents have you been involved in? Um, I was involved in four car accidents. And what was the year of your first accident? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this would be 2013. Um, I was driving the Mercedes Benz. Um, C250, and I, I was stopped, I believe, junction of uh, Powers Ferry Road and uh, Marietta, and uh, I was uh, hit from behind. But um, I, I did not sustain any injury, nor the other driver. My vehicle just had a slight scratch at the bumper. So I called the police, they came in, and uh, they get, uh, gave a citation to the other driver that hit me. So his insurance uh, fixed my vehicle. Now, in that accident in 2013, were you injured at all? I was not injured. Did you make any sort of claim for injury whatsoever? Uh, no, sir. And, not make any and why didn't you make any claim for injury? I did not make any claim because I was not uh, injured. It was a uh, minor accident. <clears throat> Now let's move on. You said you were involved in four accidents. That was the first one. Can you tell the jury about your second accident? Okay, the second one, I was uh, also driving for Lyft. So I had, uh, I was on a side road. I was trying to, uh, to turn left into Tara Boulevard. So Tara Boulevard is, uh, is, is a main street in Clayton County. So it was raining and it was dark. So I look, it's, it was, yeah, it's a dual carriageway. So you have to cross um, the first lane and then go on to, to, the, to the other lane. So I thought that I was cleared to, to make that turn. So as soon as I, I made that turn, then I scratched a vehicle that was coming on the opposite uh, direction. So the police was called and I was faulted for not leaving. So I was fined at that, I think $100 plus, so I paid that online. Now in that incident, were you injured in any way? No, I was not injured, nor the other driver. Okay, now let's talk about your third accident. Can you tell the jury what happened in the third accident? 
Okay, the third accident, I, I had to pick up a, a rider, a customer in my car, and I was traveling on the 75 North. So I branched off uh, 252B exit. So while I was standing, because it was red light, red stop light, while I was stopped, I, a couple of minutes, I don't know exactly how many, I was hit from behind. Uh, it was, a, I had a loud bang from the, uh, behind. So I got out and uh, went, approached the other driver that had hit me from behind. So I asked the driver if she was okay. So she said, yes. I checked my vehicle, I saw the damage. Then I believe I called uh, 911. So the operator told me that uh, the police will not be able to come to the location because of the COVID-19. Uh, the operator advised that uh, we should uh, exchange our information, insurance and other details. So we immediately pulled uh, on the right-hand side was a opening there was a space. So we both drove in there and uh, exchanged our information. So after that, I believe I uh, called um, the other driver's insurance to report the accident. Then I called my company Lyft. And um, once we did that, then because I had uh, someone in the car and where the accident occurred and where the customer was uh, being dropped was approximately maybe uh, three uh, minutes drive. So I dropped the customer and from there I closed for the day and went home because uh, the extent of the damage on my vehicle was heavy. I could not use it. And uh, part of uh, um, leave policy is you cannot use such vehicle to convey uh, passengers or riders. Now, on that day, uh, did you take any photographs of your vehicle? Yes, I, I did. I, I took photographs of the, of the damage on my vehicle and also photographs of the other vehicle that uh, hit me. And I'm going to direct you to um, a screen that's in front of you. Do you see a photograph? And there are... That's correct. Hold, hold on one sec. Yeah. Uh, not to interrupt, but if he could have the witness identify and authenticate any and all records before publishing them to the jury, I think that'd be appropriate. Sure. No, that's that's a valid objection. It's never interrupting. Um, and I know we're trying to keep things exactly. digital, exactly. but um, I don't have an easy way of having those two screens be. Uh, I don't know how to mess with this screen, that one that wasn't working. I mean, I brought hard copies, so if it's agreeable, I can just show him the hard copy before I publish it on the screen. It's required. It's yes. more than yes. agreeable. Let's right. do it that yes. way. Okay. Thank you. No and if you lay the foundation through him, once they're admitted, you can publish to your heart's content through the screens. All right. And just point of clarification of opposing counsel will share the exhibits with us prior to. That'd be helpful as well. Yeah, I thought you don't have them. I have them, but I don't know. He's. Which ones he's using. Exactly. Sure. Okay. Why don't you show Mr. Williams what you're going to show uh, Mr. Chia, and then we'll go from there. So. And Your Honor, I have shown defense counsel, but it's previously been marked as plaintiff's exhibit one. May I approach the witness? Yes, please. And Mr. Chi, I'm going to hand you four photographs here and uh, keep looking at those photographs. Uh, yes, this uh, vehicle is my vehicle that was uh, hit from the rear. Okay. This also is the same vehicle that was hit from the rear. 
also, this is the same vehicle that was hit from the rear. Also, this is the same vehicle that was hit from the rear. And these are all photographs that you took at the scene of your, your, took of your vehicle from this accident. That's correct, sir. Any objection to plaintiff's one? None, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Williams, if you're responding, does that cover uh, for Mr. Ham as well? Yes, Your Honor. Great. Okay. Um, one is admitted and you can publish as you see fit. So I showed you a series of, of photo photographs there and, and we'll go uh, one by one through them. Here in the end, if you can point to the damage that was caused to your vehicle. So Mr. Chia, the screen in front of you is a touch screen. If you tap the lower left-hand corner, okay. way, all the way over, lower left, no, no, corner, go all the way. Uh, this corner? Yeah, here? yeah all, more to the corner. There you go. Click on that little pencil, the little pencil icon in the oh. corner, go all the way over. Oh, no, okay. yeah, click on that, click it. I think you did it soon enough. I don't know. Try it again. Hit the. Okay, it should work. Now draw wherever the damage is. Draw a circle with your finger. Okay. I'll do it now, please. Okay. I want to see if it works. Look at that. All right. It'll be there. It's just a. It's a lag. It's it's county internet, not I, <laughs> fiber. Give him the hand. What's wrong? No, I took all the exhibits. What did I, where did I put them? Are they right in front of the podium? Oh, so where did I Don't go? lose the exhibits. <laughs> all right. So this is the damage that was done to your vehicle. Um, does this damage in any way show the impact that occurred with Miss Santana on May 5th? Uh, that's correct, sir. The, the, uh, the damage indicates that uh, it was a very um, high impact. Because as seen on uh, in the pictures, uh, the damage is quite uh, intensive. All now there are some other photos, and I'll go one by one. That was uh, the first one. Is this a similar photo or a different angle? Yeah, similar. Uh, yes, yeah, <coughs> different angle. Yes. And then this is the third photo. Yeah, same vehicle. And the final one. That's why I sent the vehicle. And now, can, can you tell the jury about the extent of the damage that was done because of the impact to the vehicle? As can be seen from the picture shown, because of the um, damage, extent damage that the vehicle had, um, this vehicle was written off. So your vehicle was total? Yes, it was total. And were you injured in this collision? That's correct. Once I was hit from the rear, the force of the, <coughs> the impact, because I was not expecting, uh, expecting that it was sudden, uh, the force moved me from my seat so somehow pushed me forward and then brought me back. So I sustained a um, lower back uh, injury, neck, and I had headache. Now you mentioned... Hold on one sec. Whenever you're ready. Now you mentioned you had been in two previous accidents where you weren't injured. How was this different from those other two accidents that occurred some years ago? Okay, the uh, the main or the uh, major uh, differences between the two other uh, accidents that I have I had was uh, they were all light. There was it wasn't as forceful as this accident. So the damages that occur on the other two vehicles were uh, minor scratches at the rear bumper. And on the, uh, on the second accident, um, 
that occurred on Tara Boulevard was just a uh, scratch. So I had um, just paint scratch. So there was no injuries. But in this accident, uh, you were injured. That's why I was injured because of the uh, impact of the cause of. Did you seek treatment for your injuries as a result of this crash? That's correct. Uh, so the next day, I believe, which is uh, May the 6th, I uh, started looking for where I could uh, get treatment. So I Googled, I believe, and I found out uh, AICA uh, in Stockbridge. That's Eagle London because I live close by there. I live in Ellenwood. Oh, I'm sorry. So I got um, an uh, uh, AICA orthopedic. Uh, they are located in Stockbridge, uh, Eagle Landing, and I made an appointment. I went there. I was evaluated for my injuries, and uh, they gave me an appointment to start uh, treatment. And how long were you, did you seek treatment at ACA? I believe this will be. At, about a month or slightly over a month. Where, did you seek ACA through from May 5th through June 29th, 2020? That's correct. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you all what's Marcus plans Don't put it on the screen yet because it's not in. And no, nope, no, nope, nope. Chia, I need you to learn how to erase. Um, there is an undo feature. Try that. See if that makes it go away. Nope. Tap the little pencil thing again in the corner. Um, there's an arrow that's like a circle. This. I don't know. There's a guard right there. Tap that. There you go. That undoes what you did. <laughs> and may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. I'm going to hand you a, a document. It's about 70 pages. And tell me if you recognize that document. You don't have to go to every page right now. Tell me if you recognize that document. Yes, I do. What do you recognize uh, this, uh, this is the uh, document representing my diagnosis, uh, treatment, and um, cost. And at this time, I'd like to move to enter Exhibit 2, uh, Baker Treatment work. I'll object at this time, Your Honor. Proper foundation has not been laid. So the objection is foundation. Mr. Chia has gone and provided testimony regarding the records where he got treatment at. These are business records which we have provided with the records. So, I don't know what those Mr. Williams, is this one of the sets of documents for which you recently received the business record certification? Correct. Okay. Um, understand your objection. I'll allow it in. So, um, that's two. Plaintiff's two is admitted. So now if you'll look at the screen here, we have uh, your treatment record with ACA, and this was on 5-6, is that correct? That's correct. Now, when you went to ACA for treatment, did you provide them with the details of your collision and let them know how you came about to suffer injury? Uh, that's correct. Is there anything in this details here that that is incorrect or that you would like to explain to the to the jury? It's all correct. Now, on here, they said um, that you haven't missed any time from work. Can you provide the jury with an explanation of why they would say that? 
a day after. Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Sustained. From the time of the accident on May 5th to May 6th, had you missed any time from work? Yes, I did because I was uh, receiving treatment and uh, I had no vehicle to walk. So the, is that your explanation as to what you told Aka when you went for treatment that day? About you're not working. That's correct. Now, if we go down a little bit here, at the time, the next day after the accident, you complained about a headache. And what was your complaint about your headache? Okay, my um, before the uh, this accident, I had no headache no any of the injuries that are sustained that is the lower back pain neck i never had that before so after this accident i was personally having headache it comes sometimes it will be more sometimes it will be less but even sitting down here right now i have a bit of headache i still have the pain and you described your pain level as seven out of 10. Was that correct? That's correct. So can, can you explain to the jury, what, what does that mean, seven out of 10? What, is, what does that mean? Okay, uh, this uh, will uh, indicate uh, the, uh, the level or the intensity of the headache I would normally uh, have uh, day. So sometimes it could be higher than that figure because the headache is always there. It, um, it doesn't go away. So moving on to the neck pain, describe to the jury the pain that you felt that was associated with the neck pain as a result of the accident. Okay. Uh, the neck pain is as a result of the accident because um, I can't uh, say I used to like because I drive for late or drive a lot. So most of the time my activity will be, uh, I'm always uh, watching both mirrors while driving. So I could, before this accident, I could turn sharply and see view any of the mirrors, uh, but now I don't have that sharp movement to, uh, to look at my mirrors, because if I turn sharply, either left or right, uh, I will feel the pain. So my uh, next movement is uh, restricted in that aspect. And finally, you complained of low back pain. Tell the jury about the low back pain that you were complaining about here. Okay, same like before, I never experienced any back pain. So this uh, back pain came about uh, this accident. So right now, um, I used to uh, drive for long hours. So my average working hours used to be about 12 hours because I could sit for that long. But now I, I can't, so the average I do now is maybe six. So even the six hours I do, so I, I will have most of the time, say if I drive for an hour or two, I'll have to take a rest, get out of the vehicle, walk around, and then uh, start over. So I'm not able to you know, work for a long period of time. So now let's move on. And I think your next data treatment with ACA would be on, Five, seven. Now, on this, it states that you were still in pain and there was no change in your condition. Was, was that accurate? That's correct. And, and can you tell the jury why your main concern was having headaches? Can you tell them about that as you stated to Aka for that treatment? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yes. Can you tell the jury why your main one of your main concerns was the headaches that you were having? 
Okay, one of my main uh, concerns uh, is I, like I said, I never had that headache before. So um, naturally, I'm a bit uh, scared. I don't know what uh, might happen. So I'm always scared when the headache comes. So I don't. So that's my main, uh, you know, uh, concern regarding my headache. I don't want it to, like, I don't know if it might someday go higher or cause me uh, more problems or issues. So I'm, I'm a bit worried about that. Okay. So your next treatment would be on 5-11. 2020. Now, this day, you went for chiropractic treatment. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And was this treatment helpful in addressing the pain that was occurring with you? Yes. Uh, after receiving this uh, treatment, my uh, pain, like the lower back pain, neck, uh, went down. So most of the time, when I go in for this uh, treatment, it sort of improve my uh, my pains. I feel better, but it's always there. It's not totally um, clear or cured. Okay. Now your next visit, you go. It's on five twelve. So can you tell the jury why were you going to these treatments? So most importantly, uh, I was attending this appointments or treatment regularly because I wanted to um, have it cured or taken care of because I am like the main uh, breadwinner in my family. So I like to work and provide for them. So when I get this treatment and I get good or better, it allows me to, to go to work. So I'm not the type of person that don't want to work. I want to work to feed my family, put food on their table. So speaking of work, uh, this record indicates that it says, Mr. Chia stated, I have been able to work with the pain in my neck and lower back. Was that statement correct? No, during the, uh, this treatment, I was not able to work. So that statement wasn't, that's not a correct statement. That's correct. And so from, and now we're at May 11th. So from May 5th through May 12th, you weren't able to work at all. Up That's to right. this point, correct. Right. All right. And when is the last time you worked? Was that your last lift ride on May 5th? That's correct. Right. So we will move on to your, your next visit with ACA, which would be on May 13th. This just a quick question. I don't know how many visits there are. Are we going through every single visit we're or we're every, highlighting certain visits? Yep, we're we're going to go through every visit because we want to lay the foundation and let the jury know what Mr. Chia had to go through every day to go to get these frequent treatments. Okay. Now, on May 13th, you go back for a follow up treatment. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, there was still no pain, in, no change in your pain. Uh, that's correct. And Your Honor, I will move along. We won't be on all the records for long periods of time. Before you go any further, yes, sir. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I've been allowing him to basically do um, leading questions to try to move this along, but at this point it's getting a little repetitive, so I'm going to object any further leading questions as we go. Okay, I appreciate your discretion on that one, but, and I know you're trying to um, move us through the records, but... Um, the defense is now going to be objecting if if you ask Mr. Chia leading questions. So I didn't hear that specific question, um, but I'll be listening for leading as opposed to however you're going to ask it. Understood, General. Okay. 
Now, on this May 13th, 2020 visit, um, was there any change in your pain levels? There was no change. And so now we've gone through about four visits with ACA and you're still in pain. That's the best person. So your next visit with ACA would be on 518. Can you tell the jury what was going on at this time? So about five days have passed. I was still having pains with my lower back, leg, and uh, headache. And so that was 518. You go back again on 519. Can you tell the jury what was going on at that point? Okay, it will be the same. Um, I was still having same pain at this particular time. And we'll move on to your next visit on 522. Now, what did you indicate to Aka what was going on with you at that time? Yeah, I'm, I'm objecting to this line of question. He's basically just using the records to refresh his recollections continuously as opposed to just asking what happened. So um, he can certainly use the records to refresh his recollection, but we need to make sure it's happening in the right way. So it's going to make it a little more involved. But um, what I need you to do, um, Mr. Huntley, is before you put the record up, ask Mr. Chia what he remembers, and if he doesn't, with reviewing the records, refresh his recollection, and then um, he, of course, is free to do that. Right. Thank you. So, Mr. Chia, do you recall going to ACA on 5-22-20? I do. Do you recall what you said to them on that day? Yeah, I do. I told them that I still have the same pain, my lower back pain, neck, and headache. Did you indicate that your pains were more severe? Objection, Your Honor, leading. Overruled. Uh, what I will tell them uh, will be the same that I still have the uh, uh, pains in the uh, areas that I had uh, complained. During this visit, did they refer you anywhere? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. I'm asking for his understanding of what was told to him. It's a common sense impression of his understanding of the treatment that he was receiving. No, it would be hearsay, but you can ask him if he ended up going anywhere after his treatment at ACA. So after your visit on 522, did you wind up going anywhere else for treatment? No, this would be uh, the same uh, facility that um, I, I had uh, received most of my treatment. Um, other area, areas that uh, I went during this uh, period will be uh, to, to a facility to have my MRI scan done. And do you recall the name of that facility? I don't on this particular date. If I was to show you a record, could that refresh your recollection of the facility that you went to see? Uh, that would be correct. Okay. So I'm going to show you. Um, an don't exhibit. put it on the screen. Well, it's in this exhibit. Oh, this something is already in Yeah, this oh. whole exhibit's in me. Go for it. <laughs> that <laughs> that's that's why I did it that way. So we wouldn't have to go back and forth. Okay. Uh, Oops, went the wrong way. Makes no sense. Okay. 
Okay. Is this the name of the, the surgery center where you went to have your MRI performed? That, that would be correct. And also, yeah. Okay. So on round about 522, you went to the Summit Surgery Center to have an MRI performed. What's your understanding of why did you need to have an MRI performed? Okay, that was a- uh, Objection, Your Honor. Fact witness, he can't testify as to why he underwent MRI with any treatment. Your Honor, it's his understanding of how he was treating his own injury. We're not asking for expert testimony here. We're not asking him to tell us, you know, that he had some hydro incision. We're asking him what he understood was being done to his body. Okay. Your I heard your question a little bit differently, which either would be hearsay. Why did you go there? Because someone told me X, Y, or Z. Um, I heard Mr. Williams's concern a little different from mine, which was that somehow like you were just responding to, Mr. Chia would be offering expert testimony. You need to ask a different question. Yes. So, Mr. Chia, you received treatment from ACA, which we know. That's correct. You went to receive an MRI. That's correct. So, when you went to receive the MRI, do you know why you were going to receive your MRI? Uh, that's correct. Uh, the MRI, after uh, it was carried out, it showed the uh, detailed- um... Objection, Your Honor. Hold on one sec. Um, so it's important that, uh, at, it wasn't your question, but Mr. Chia, you need, you, you're not one of the doctors in this case. So it's important that unless someone asks specifically, what did Dr. So-and-so tell you? Don't talk about what the doctor said. So that MRI, some doctor may have looked at it and said to you, this MRI shows X. Um, unless one of these lawyers said, what did the doctor say? Please don't get into what the doctors told you, okay? You didn't do anything wrong. I just need to make sure that we, we stay clear of hearsay. Do you understand what I just said? Yeah, I think so. Good. All right, we'll give it a try. Right. Next question. Or same question, but you need to ask it in a different way. Do you have an understanding of why you were having the MRI performed on you? That's correct. You do have an understanding. What was your understanding of why the MRI was being performed? I believe my, uh, my basic understanding why uh, the MRI, MRI was done was to uh, show more detail uh, or clearer picture of um, the injury that uh, I sustained. Was your injury getting better with chiropractic treatment alone? Yes, e each time I uh, receive the treatment, I get, uh, I get better. However, was it resolving the injuries completely? No, it wasn't resolving any of the injuries uh, completely. Was this MRI going to help you receive further treatment? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Overruled. You can answer. Yes, because I believe that uh, the MRI will indicate the extent uh, of the damage uh, of, the, um, of the injury. So it shows clearer picture and what extent it was. Uh, damage. After your MRI, did you go back to your chiropractor or did you receive some other form of treatment? Yeah, I did um, also receive um, uh, I also received um, 
uh, epidural uh, this injection at my lower back, I believe it to be uh, at this uh, at the same uh, location. Now, on 5-26-2020, you went to see an orthopedic specialty clinic. Do you recall doing that? That's correct. Uh, do you recall exactly what happened there that day? I believe that's uh, uh, that was the uh, location that I, I received the uh, epidural injection. Do you recall what your pain level was when you went to the orthopedic specialty clinic on 526? I, I can't uh, definitely say what level it was, but uh, the pain was still uh, there. If I showed you a record from your visit on 526, would that help refresh your recollection on your pain levels that day? That's correct. So on 526, what was your chief complaint? This will be the same complaints that I have, that I have been treated for lower back pain, neck, and headache. Now, it says that your pain level varied from five to seven. Was that statement correct? That's correct. So can you tell the jury kind of what your average pain level from a five to seven, what did, what did that mean? Okay. Um, this is the uh, intensity, uh, intensity of my pain. So uh, like uh, it will go, the pain will go high some days or sometimes then uh, come down some days. Now, on this visit, um, were you provided with a back brace? That's correct. I was uh, provided with, uh, with a back brace, but I can uh, only use it while uh, standing. So uh, it did help, but uh, it never... Um, resolve my problem. It will give me uh, back support. And how long did you use the back race? About uh, two years. Do you currently still use the back race? Yes, I use it from uh, time to time when uh, my pain is uh, um, like high or intense, yeah, like high. Do you find it helpful to alleviate any of your pain? Yes, sir. At any time, does it ever alleviate all of your pain? No, it does not. Now, on 527, you're still at ACA and you went for another visit. Is that correct? That's correct. So now we're on about nine visits with, with ACA and you have had, have you had an MRI at this point? That's correct. So on, I'm going to show you, do you remember going to have the MRI performed? Um, I remember, but um, I wouldn't know the exact date, but uh, if shown, then um, it will jog my memory. All right. So on 527, we said you, you had another, you went for a treatment. Was your status about the same on 527? That's correct. Now, on 529, you stated that you had... Uh, yeah, let me, let me object. He's just showing them the record without... He's just well, continuously he's, doing... The, hold on. Let him finish I'm the sorry, objection. You're absolutely continuously correct. trying to refresh your recollection. I think it's totally improper for him to just keep doing this to show him the jury as well. I'm sorry. Can you not hear me? Okay. Can, I'm sorry, Judge. Was that not clear? No, it was, but... Um, this is already in evidence, Correct. so this can be published to the jury. 
Um, it also can be used to refresh Mr. Chia's recollection. Those two things can happen at the same time. So I guess I'm not following your objection. Your Honor, just to have Mr. Chia read from the documents, I think it's improper. If the documents can stand for themselves, and just to have them published to the jury, I think it's inappropriate as it's doing it. Okay, I got it. Um, let's let's keep going. So here we are on on five twenty nine, um, and you had an MRI. That's correct. And do you remember? Um, after you had this MRI, what was your understanding of what your injuries were at that time? Uh, my uh, basic uh, understanding um, after the MRI um, showed that I had a herniated disc, it's called herniation. Did you understand what that meant? Well, well, I did after looking it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I won't get into, you know, what is it? I won't ask you to explain what it is to the jury. But tell me, after you found out what your injury was, did you know how you had to go about treating that injury? I know that I uh, received uh, uh, treatment for it. And what type of treatment were you going to receive for it? I believed um, I was going to get like a, a surgical uh, procedure uh, for the uh, correction of the uh, herniated uh, disc. Now, was that the only injury that you understood that you had after you had that MRI on, um, let's call it, it's 526? Yeah, it's 526. I'm sorry. Was that the only thing that was wrong with you? Did you understand that to be your only injury, a herniated disc? Well, uh, there, there was also, um, I don't know if it's the same, um, uh, the doctor indicated that uh, muscle was to say that. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Right, so we're getting into an area that if you want to explore with a medical professional, you can, but Absolutely, Mr. Chia is not the right yep. and I'm gonna move channel on. through which diagnostic evidence should come. So on... 527, um, we talked about that. And now we're going into 61. Were you still being treated by ACA at that point? That's correct. Now, for these disc herniations, did you ever have any other type of treatment besides chiropractic care? Uh, that's correct. And what type of treatment did you have? Um, I had the uh, uh, the. The, the Tommy? Okay. And that's going to be, we're going to get to that. But right now we're just talking about your treatment with ACA and Summer. So with ACA, what other treatment did you have for your herniated disc other than the chiropractic treatment? I, um, I had the uh, epidural injection. And do you know what date you had the epidural injection? Uh, no, I can't remember the date. Do you know what that consisted of? Were you sedated in any way? I know that the uh, my back was uh, numb before the, uh, I was um, a little bit tra uh, traded uh, at my lower back. Was this procedure painful? No, it, it was not uh, painful. Did this procedure provide you with any relief? Yes, it did. Uh, temporarily provided uh, uh, my back, my lower back pain uh, uh, relief. 
Did it provide any relief to your neck pain? No, it did not. And you said it temporarily provided relief. How long is temporarily? I don't know exactly how many days that uh, relief lasted, but I went back to the same uh, state of uh, still having the lower back pain. So with ACA, you had this chiropractic treatment and now you had this injection. Can you tell the jury how this helped your injury, if at all? Yes, uh, it did. Uh, after receiving this treatment, it did uh, uh, relieve my pain, but it did not permanently uh, cure, cure my pain because I see have uh, these pains. Now, and, and that brings us to, so, and, and we'll go through this swiftly. So you had your injection and you had a few more visits with ACA. Is that correct? That's right. Now on your last visit with ACA, um, on 629, you go for a follow-up visit. Do you recall going for that follow-up visit? That's correct. Now, this was after you had the injection for, after you had the injection. That's correct. And do you recall what you said to the provider on that day about your pain levels and where you are, where you were with your treatment? Yeah, I believe I did uh, indicated that um, my pain level was, um, less because of the treatment that I have received. Yeah. Did you tell the provider that all of your injuries from this accident had resolved? No, I did not because I still um, had the, uh, the pains at my lower back, neck, and uh, headache. So... Even though you had had the injections and you had the chiropractic treatment, you were still injured from this accident. That's correct. Now, you stopped treatment after 629. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the date that um, Eka told me that uh, I had uh, completed my treatment. And so after this date on 629, did you go back to work? No, I did not uh, go back to work. So after this treatment on 629, when did you go back to work? After this treatment, I went to, because uh, during this uh, period of uh, receiving uh, treatment from uh, ECA, um, I had no vehicle because I wasn't uh, paid for the total of my vehicle, so I had no vehicle to, to work with. Now, on the 629 visit to ACA, you say your neck pain, your headaches were still four out of four, your neck pain was one out of one, and your low back pain was two out of two at worst. Was this an accurate depiction of the pain you were going in, going through on, on 629 at that time? That's correct. So, just going through all the visits and in, in summation, you would have you had about twenty five visits with Aka from five six through six twenty nine. Is that correct? That's correct. You also we talked about the injections that you had because of the MRI. Is that correct? That's correct. Now all of this stuff it wasn't free, was it? No, it wasn't free. Did you receive a bill from Aka for your chiropractic treatment? That's correct. Uh, do you recall how much that bill totaled? Uh, I believe it was, uh, one was, I believe 9,000 or 10,000 plus. But uh, approximately it was over, I think 10,000. So if I showed you the record of the bill, could you verify if this was the amount that you were charged? That would be correct. So I'm going to take you to... Um, just the total here, and it's showing the grand total of 
$52.50 for your chiropractic treatment with ACA. Is that correct? That would be correct. Now I'm going to take you the epidural and your MRI. That was a separate expense. Is that correct? That's correct. And so I'm going to take you here to give you a grand total of $9,108.40. Is that correct? That, uh, uh, it is correct. And your honor, we are going to go into the comprehensive record. So I don't know if you would like to take a lunch break or ask the jury, or we can keep going. It's up to you. I just want to let the court know before. Got it. We Meaning got we're it. shifting away from AICA correct. to comprehensive. That is correct. Okay. And is that the other set of medical records or? That is correct. Okay. Um, will you guys tell me? Um, we can take your lunch break now um, and then we'll pick up or we can go a little further and have lunch at 1230, do 15 more minutes. Um, I don't know if you have a spokesperson yet. Um, not yet. But if any of you wants a break, we should take a break. Um, if you're all good going for a few more minutes, we'll do that. I don't want to impose that. We've been going not two hours yet because we got the late start, but sure. Why don't we do that? So why don't we, well, but if we're going to take a bathroom break, we might just break for lunch. Um, the other option would be do a bathroom break because I, I want to respect that. And But we'll commit then to maybe lunch would be 1245. So we'll get another half hour in after a short bathroom break. Does anyone object to doing that? Seeing no objection. Why don't we, you all, if you want to go back to the jury room, in fact, you should all go back to the jury room, but I'll have deputy um, Gordon, get you back in here in about five minutes. We'll go another half hour, get through some more medical records, and then break for lunch. Please don't talk about the case while you're back there. No outside research. Um, we'll see you in a few minutes. All right, Mr. Huntley, anything before we take a quick break? I uh, know, Your Honor. You've I, got the records ready to go? I have the records ready to go. You've got a hard copy? I have a hard copy here. Okay. Um, Mr. Williams, anything before break? Nope. Mr. Ham? All right, see you guys in about five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
share. <laughs> Come back up, Mr. Chip. Ms. Rivers, you ready? Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Huntley, ready for the jury? I am ready. Mr. Williams? Ready, Your Honor. And Mr. Ham. Ready. Let's bring him in. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Gordon. You all can be seated. I forgot to mention one thing. You take a seat, Mr. Chip. Um, the seats that you're in, um, don't take possession of them. Um, meaning, um, as you come in next time, try to sit in a different spot. You'll literally see things differently. Those of you who are way down there, you're a little further away from the witness. Um, so switch it up a little bit. The only exception is Sometimes folks who sit on the end sit on the end because they might need to stand every once in a while because of bad back or something. You're welcome to claim those seats. Otherwise, um, you are not required to be in the same seats each time. I encourage you to, to mix it up. But if, if there's a particular perspective you really like getting, you can try to get that. And the best you can come in in the order of people sitting way down there, come in first, the easiest because the aisles are a little narrow. All right, we are resuming where we left off. Mr. Chia is still subject to direct examination from Mr. Huntley, who told us he's got a whole other set of medical records he wants to go through. We'll make it swift, or as swift as possible. So where we left off, and we talked about the bills from ACA and SUMIC. Now let's talk about this. Now, although you finish the treatment with ACA and SUMIC, um did they resolve all your injuries no sir my injuries were not resolved although they didn't resolve all your injuries do you think that the treatment was necessary yeah it was necessary because it uh, uh while i was taking the treatment it reduced uh, my pains so knowing what you know now if you had to do it all over again would you go and get the treatment again yes i will i will now, I know we briefly talked about this and we're going to go back into it. After your 629 visit with ACA, you said you did not go back to work. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, do you know when you actually went back to work? Um, I believe this would be uh, August. Do you have a roundabout date in August that you went? About the 7th. So around August 7th, you went and you started driving Lyft again. That's correct. Now... I know we previously talked about three accidents that you were in, including this accident, but you said in your lifetime you had been in four accidents. Can you tell us about the fourth accident? Uh, my Lord, is it possible to have the picture? 
um, that was earlier this place where that came. So um, you don't get to ask questions. You only get to answer questions. Um, the question right now is, can you tell us all about the fourth accident? If you don't remember the fourth accident, you can tell your lawyer you don't remember it. But um, he'll he'll decide what exhibits, if any, he wants to use. Okay. So why don't you ask the question okay. again, and we'll see what Mr. Chia responds. We talked about you originally. You said you had been for, involved in four accidents in your lifetime. That's correct. We've talked about three of those accidents, including the one in May of 2020 with Ms. Santana. That's correct. There is a fourth accident. Do you recall having a fourth accident? I do recall. Okay. Did that ac Do you remember when that accident occurred? Uh, this was in uh, August 2020. Okay. Now tell the jury about what happened in this accident. Okay, um, I was driving down, going south with my 2015 Dodge Journey Crossroad. So it's like um, two lanes uh, going south and two lanes going north. On what road? Moreland Avenue. Moreland. Yeah. So the traffic was slow. I was on the I was traveling south. I was on the far right lane. So suddenly, as I was traveling, um, I, a truck or van suddenly veered or tried to, because uh, close to the far lane, um, there's a gas station there. So he was traveling north. So he quickly turned left to go into the gas station uh, without uh, noticing that I was on the far uh, right lane going north. As soon as he crossed my path, I T-boned him. So uh, we uh, called the police. They came and um, he was uh, cited for that. So this accident wasn't your fault? No, it wasn't my fault. And the accident, let's talk about the impact. You said you T-boned him. Can you explain to the jury the impact of this accident when the cars collided? Okay, uh, due to the uh, low speed that I was coming on, so uh, there was minor damage on my front vehicle also, uh, his vehicle, there was, um, I did not sustain any uh, injury. So, what vehicle were you driving on that day? I, I was driving a 2015 Dodge Ram. And did you take pictures of that, of your vehicle that day? I did. And I'm going to show defense counsel was previously been marked as plaintiff's exhibit five, so two page back. Five. Five. I know I'm out of order. It's not a problem. I just need to know the number. And may I approach the witness? Yep. I'm going to hand you a two page document here and tell me if you recognize these photos. Yeah, the first one is my uh, Dodge Johnny Crossroad. Also, the second picture also indicates that. At this time, I'd like to move to plaintiff's exhibit five. Order. Any objection to the admission of plaintiff's five? None. Admitted. Now I'm going to pull up on the screen here. And is this a picture of the Dodge journey that was involved in the August accident? That, that's correct. Now, this is the second photo, and this is the first 
photo if my computer will work. Is that correct? That's correct. So it looks like the damage to your vehicle is less severe than the May accident. That's correct. And why do you think that is so? I believe that because I was uh, traveling on a low speed and uh, I hit the other vehicle at the lower speed. So that's why I got this uh, damage. Now, in this collision, were you injured? I was not injured, but what uh, I experienced um, that the, uh, my- uh, Hold on, hold on one sec. You need to make your phone not make noise, please. I was Whether it needs to go in a pocket or something, but it's buzzy, buzzy. Thank you. Sorry about that, Sean. Go ahead. Okay, this, uh, this accident caused my uh, previous uh, injury that I had with the uh, Ultima in May to, um, to let go high, like sort of uh, increase my pain. Are you saying that you didn't suffer any new injuries from this accident? No, I didn't suffer any new injuries. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you state that the injuries you suffered from May were made worse because of this accident? That's correct. Now, were these injuries as painful as the injuries you suffered in May? No, they totally uh, uh, increased the, uh, the injury that I had in, uh, in May. So it made the May injury worse than what it already was. That's correct. And you previously stated that after your visit in June 29th with ACA and Summit, that your injuries had not resolved. That's correct. Now, on a, if we had a pie and we call it 100% pie, how much of the pain that you suffered from the May accident and the August accident, how much, how would you divide that pie? Okay, um, I would divide it, uh, say, 98% uh, uh, to, to the May um, accident because that accident was, I had more impact and it, it caused uh, my main injuries than 2% to the uh, Dutch Johnny injury because I, I did not sustain any new injuries. So it was, it just increased uh, what injury, uh, pain that I had uh, from the ultimate, um, that's me, accident. Now, after this August 26th, 2020 accident, did you go back to work? No, I did not go back to work immediately. I had a couple of uh, days off. I don't know, exactly. I can't uh, recall how many days I was off. Now, after this accident, did you go anywhere for treatment for your injuries? Uh, that's correct, I did. And where did you go? I, I went to uh, comprehensive uh, spine and pain. And why I went there is because uh, while uh, talking to my um, attorney, uh, Mr. Buddy, uh, he did uh, indicate to me that uh, uh, he had a previous uh, back injury and um, that facility uh, uh, treated his injuries, uh, back pain uh, to his uh, satisfaction. So I decided uh, to go there myself because I have uh, uh, similar injuries. And when did you go to the comprehensive spine? Uh, I believe this will be uh, uh, ninth, the ninth month, that's September. September, correct. And I'm going to show uh, defense counsel, these are 
This is plaintiff's exhibit three. Exhibit three. And that's just a comprehensive strong record. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. All three attorneys have continuing authority to approach witnesses unless it is rescinded. I'm going to hand you a document, and I want you to review it and tell me um, what you recognize this document as. Uh, this will be my uh, uh, treatment uh, charge and uh, charges. That's comprehensive. Yep. And I'll Same objection as before? Correct. Okay. So there is a certification of business records only recently received. Correct. All right. I will, for the reasons before, I understand the objection, overrule it. I find the certification along with uh, Mr. Chia's identification is sufficient, but I will observe the late delivery without the notice that typically accompanies it of the certification. You may proceed. Now, on your visit with Comprehensive Spine, did you tell them about your May accident as well as the August accident? That's correct. Sir. And on your visit, I think you said, and it was 9-9, what did you indicate your pain level as being? Um, well, I told them that uh, I had the uh, existing pain. So on this particular uh, date uh, would be eight. So when you were telling them that your pain scale was an eight, were you just talking about the August accident or were you talking about the May accident or a combination of the two? It would be a combination of the two. Now, I know we previously talked about when you left ACA, I think your pain scale was a a two, a one, and a four. So when you got into the accident in August, was your pain scale still a two, a one, and a four? No, it wasn't. It's, what was your pain level when you got into the accident? Prior to you getting into the accident, what was the pain level? I know I had the, uh, I still had the pain. Um, if I put a figure on it, it would be maybe uh, between six, seven. Okay. Seven. And let's talk about it. We, we talked about that overall, but let's talk about it individually. Let's talk about your headache pain. Then let's talk about your neck pain and then your back pain. What was the pain scale for each one of those? Um, I will put the back pain at about um, seven, uh, neck, uh, same, I'll put the average, same, same number seven. Now, when you went to them, you said you told them about your accident for May and the one in August, correct? That's right. So were you honest with all of your treatment providers about the nature of your injuries and the extent of the pain that you were suffering That's during correct. the course of those injuries? Mm -hmm. Now, did Comprehensive end up treating you for your injuries? Yes, they did. And do you know what type of treatment they provided for you? 
Um, I was uh, provided with uh, the, the cetomy, or I might pronounce it that wrongly, but uh, I think it's called uh, the cetomy. That's correct. No. D I S C E C T O M Y, disectomy. 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 Say that fast five times. So, were you in agreement with this treatment plan? That's the question. Now, prior to them performing this disectomy, did you have another MRI performed? Um, I can't recall it. Okay. So, if I were to show you a record, I'm going to give you plans in the court. This is in that record that I just provided. I just pulled it out. It's easier to find that way. That's just a, a MRI of AHI. And that's in the comprehensive record. Now I'm going to show you a document, and I want you to review this document and let me know if you recognize it, what you recognize it as. What number is this? This is plaintiff's exhibit number four. Yeah, this will be um, the uh, facility that um, I did the uh, MRI. Okay. For and we'll move to enter plaintiff's exhibit for the record. This is the MRI from AHI. So this is a subset of what you've already admitted? It's just easier to pull it out this way. It's part of what exhibit that was already admitted? Um, exhibit number three. Comprehensive spine records. Okay. So any objections that you might have, Mr. Williams, are the same because it comes from that universe of records? None. No objections? No objections. Oh, okay. Plaintiff's four is admitted without objection. All right. So do you recall having an MRI now at um, American Health Image on roughly 825.20? That's correct. And do you know what the results of that MRI indicated? Before you answer that. Hearsay, Your Honor. Right. I, I Sustained. So you went and had the MRI on 8-25-2020. That's correct. And as a result of that MRI, what was your next course of treatment? Okay, I then um, had an appointment with uh, uh, comprehend, uh, Comprehensive. Okay. Yeah. So after the MRI, then you had another appointment with Comprehensive. It, would you say it was roughly on 925? And this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 3 that's in the record. Just that's, that's correct. Before you go any further, Mr. Williams, is Plaintiff's 4 the same as your Exhibit E? And plaintiff's 4 was the MRI, Your Honor? Yes, sir. One second, Your Honor. We can sort this out over the lunch break. I just wanted to know if there were if was overlap. Back back to your questions. So after the MRI, uh, you went back to comprehensive for treatment on 925. That's correct. And is it at this point you were recommended for the disectomy? That's correct. Now, is it your understanding um, 
based on the MRIs, do you know if there was a difference in the injuries you suffered from the May MRI to the August MRI? Don't, don't answer the question. Objection, hearsay. Sustained. Based on your MRI in May, and then based on your MRI in August, did you come to find out you had incurred a new injury? Don't, don't answer the question. Same objection. Sustained. So, Mr. Chia, you stated previously in May you were injured and you had yes. an MRI. In August, you were in another accident. Is that correct? That's correct. You stated that your injuries in August were not new. Is that correct? That's correct. So after you got your treatment and your MRI with comprehensive, do you know if you were being treated for a new injury or not? Don't, don't answer the question. Same objection, Your Honor. Right. You're doing a good job trying to skin the cat in different ways, but this isn't the witness who's going to get an answer to that question if there's an answer out there. All right. So tell me, on your May 20, I mean, your 925 visit with comprehensive, what was your pain level? I would say a six. Now, of the pain level of a six, did you have any new injury from August? Accident? No. Now, eventually, you said that you had a disectomy at Comprehensive. Is that correct? That's correct. Do you recall the date that you had that? Uh, I don't recall. Uh, recall it. And if I showed you a record, would that rec refresh your rec That's recollection? Correct. So on October 26, 2020, if you can look here, um, did you go in and have a disectomy? That's correct. Do you, can you explain to the jury what happened to you? How was this disectomy performed? Uh, well, basically it was a uh, surgery that uh, was performed. Um, I had uh, uh, the the entry. I was sedated anyway, so the uh, the the entry was at my lower back, and um, I believe um, it was to 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 correct the uh, the herniated disc. Now, can you tell the jury was that procedure painful? It, uh, because I was sedated, so I wouldn't uh, categorically say it was painful or not. What about the next day after the procedure? Were you in any sort of pain? Yes, I was. Because, and uh, because I was, um, I was given um, some. Uh, um, um, uh, head and pain uh, medication. And how long did that pain last from the surgery? A couple of days. After the couple of days passed, how were you feeling? I, I felt much better, but um, after that, um, um, I see uh, I was still having uh, uh, the lower back pain. So even with this surgery, um, all of your pain wasn't resolved? No, sir, it wasn't resolved. Do you think this surgery was necessary to help you get better? Yeah, it was. If you had to do it again, would you choose this course of treatment? Yes, sir. Now, this course of treatment, of course, costs money. Did, were you billed for this treatment? That's correct. Do you remember the amount? that this cost? Uh, I believe it was uh, 220 something thousand. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a, a, a final bill here and you tell me. 
if that is the cost, $227,624 and on one second. Objection, Your Honor, can we take that down? Can you take, slide that page off? Thank you. May I approach, Your Honor? Um, can we talk during the break? Uh, it involves this exhibit. We don't need to, that's already in, this exhibit is in. Uh -huh. And so if um, uh, Mr. Huntley wants to use it in closing, for example, I think we could address your concern. Okay. Um, I'll just ask him not to put it back up on the screen Thank right you. now. So we, we saw a brief amount there, $227,624 and 20 cents. Is that correct? That's correct. Is that the amount cost of the treatment that you incurred for the dissector? That's correct. Now, you stated that you only missed a couple of days of work from the August 2020 accident. That's correct. Can you tell the jury why you were able to get back to work a lot swifter after the August accident as compared to the May accident? <laughs> okay, um, I was able to get back, back to work quicker than the uh, May accident because I did not sustain any new injury. The, inju uh, the injury that has uh, sustained with the uh, August was just, uh, it increased the previous injuries that I, that I had with the, uh, with the Ultima that is in, in May. Now, Mr. Chia, prior to these accidents, you stated you were gainfully employed? That's why I was uh, working with this. And that was through the course of 2019 and 2020? That's correct. And during those years, did you file tax returns? That's correct. And I'll show uh, Defense Counsel Plaintiff Exhibit 6, uh, uh, Schedule C from Mr. Chief's tax returns. And Mr. Chia, I'm gonna show you what is a two, three page back. Show me if you recognize this. Okay, this is a 2019, uh, my tax return, 2020, my tax return. And then the last page, my lost wages. And I will move to enter plaintiff's exhibit six. Is it right? So six is an excerpt from two tax returns <laughs> and then a piece of paper that's not a tax return. It's not a okay, multicolored piece of paper. Mr. Williams, any objection to the admission of plaintiff six? No. Okay, admitted. Now we're gonna go here. So we're at one. Um, is this a natural break point? You have five minutes left. I'm not rushing, you have four hours left with Mr. Chia, but if it's four hours, then We'll, oh, you were gonna work through these slides. Why don't you work through those slides, then I'll ask you the question I was gonna okay. ask you. Sorry. And, and I, I promise you, I will try to get this done. I think we can be close to the end if we just okay. wrap this up. Let's do it. Okay, so Mr. Chia, does this document here, the 2019 tax returns, and I'm gonna take you to line number one, uh, 77,495. What does that number represent? Uh, that uh, represented money that made for that particular uh, total money that made for that particular year. And you made that money driving Lyft, is that correct? That's correct. Well, so we're going to go to 2020, the next page here. Same question, line number one. However, this line indicates you made $56,194. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, during the course of 2020, did you work for Lyft? That's correct. And your employment was the same as it was in 2019. That's correct. Except you weren't able to work as many hours. That's correct. That, that's because of uh, uh, my pains that I sustained from the uh, May accident. And now I'm going to take you to the final page here. And it shows income from 2019, then your income, 
minus your income from 2020. And we have a big lost wages in red of $21,301. Is that a reflection of the wages you lost between 2019 and 2020? That's correct. Now, I know we've gone over a lot, um, but let's talk about how the May 2020 collision has affected your life, if at all. You know, tell the jury exactly what you've gone through since that accident in May 2020. Well, um, the May, uh, that's the, the May accident caused a lot of hardship uh, within my family because I was uh, the sole breadwinner. I did not work during those three months, that is May, June, July, that I, well, uh, my, I was on treatment and did not have a vehicle. So that caused a lot of hardship within my family. My, my wife, was, she was not happy with me because nothing was coming in. My children were not happy. So it did cause a lot of hardship, stress and pain. Also, um, my, uh, my children, they were a bit scared because they drive also. So most of the time, um, I will be the one telling them how to be careful on the road. So sometimes I will, my wife would tell me that, that or my children are laughing at me that how come I always tell them that uh, they should be careful on the road and uh, get into accidents. So I would tell them, I mean, it's not my fault, it just happens. So my boy, he's uh, 17 now. When I stay out late, sorry. Um, he will call me to to check up to check on my phone. Okay, he's always scared about that. I will come home alive or not by himself. I'm sorry. So that put a lot of stress on my, on my family. Do you have other questions I, for I Mr. I have a Chief? few more questions, but I would be okay if we took a break and I can. My wrap Why don't you up wrap up swiftly. All right. So, you know, in, in, in summation, and I just want to get this in as an exhibit. This is what we talked about. I want to show you um, documents and it outlines your bill costs and summary, ACA, and comprehensive are those amounts. Should have a reflection of the amount of bills you should Yes, that's correct. Now, we'll take in the plaintiff's exhibit seven. Thank you, Any objection to plaintiff seven? None. Admitted. Now, Mr. Chia, I, I know this is an emotional thing for you, but this is the only time that the jury is going to get to hear from you. Can you, you know, discuss exactly what do you mean by? the stress you incurred, the income. And, and I think you mentioned you know, your son worried about you. Yeah, also, um, It did uh, cause a lot of um, issues with my wife because of the the lower back pain that I had. 
so um that um reduce the uh, intimacy that oh normally normally have with my wife because um I was not able to um, I was not able to uh, I was not able to carry out the uh, intimacy that uh, we used to have. So sometimes, I will not go home on time so that I don't have issues with my wife. Then because of that, she'll be angry, she'll be stressed. She will not cook for me. So uh, it causes a lot of problems. So yeah, it is still ongoing. Now, you know, we discussed your wife and your children, but they're not here today. Is there a reason why you're not bringing them in here today to talk about or tell your story? Uh, my uh, my daughter, she's not here today because um, she's uh, writing her exams. Uh, she's um, she's studying at uh, Chamberlain College of Nursing to be a nurse. Can you say that again? She's studying where? She's studying uh, at Chamberlain College of Nursing uh, to be a nurse. This is her final year, so she has gone for uh, to take her exams. My son, he's, uh, he just finished high school. So he's uh, taking some extra classes uh, at uh, Clayton County. And then uh, he, he works at a car wash um, center on the, he was on, uh, he was as a car. Uh, wash guy, so he's there at the moment. Uh, this is a I'm proud of him because um, he does not ask me for pocket money, so he gets his money by doing those jobs. Also, he's um, he's good at designing, so he designs t-shirts and sells to his friends and sometimes on the internet. So my My wife, she's not able to be here today because uh, she's a cancer patient. On uh, Tuesday, I had to rush out to the hospital. You need to say that again, please. Uh, my wife, she's not able to be here today with me because on Sunday, this past Sunday, I had to rush out to, to the hospital. That is a uh, Emory um, Hospital on Clifton Road. Uh, she has been going through chemo. So last Sunday, it was, she was in so much pain. <laughs> so I had to take, rush out to the hospital. So at the moment, she's on, she's on admission. So I had to leave her this morning to come down here. So that's why she's not here. <laughs> I, I have no further questions of this witness. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. Mr. Chia, thank you for sharing what you've shared. We're going to break for lunch. When we get back, I'll see if the defense has any questions for Mr. Chia. Um, that clock is a little slow, but that's the one we run off of because we can all see it. If I try to get us back together at two, 
Does that give everyone enough time? Anyone want more time than that? Well, what does your clock say right now? It says what? Okay, so then be back um, at four minutes later than what I said. Um, around two on that clock, I'm going to ask Deputy Gordon, who's back there, try to be back as close to um, 205 <laughs> as you can be. It is fine to eat lunch with each other. It is fine to say, I've just been around the other 12 of you and eat solo. You can bring food back in here. You cannot bring into the building. Like if you go to some restaurant, they give you a metal knife. Metal knives don't go well with the metal detectors. Um, but you're welcome to bring your food back here. I forgot to say this because we got to a late start. There's a fridge back there. You found it. That water is for you. And if it gets empty, we'll bring more water. The coffee machine, the little K-cup thing, that's for you. Those are your, um, yes, uh, appliances. There are your appliances and your supplies. If something's running low, let us know. Um, please don't talk about the case if you have lunch with each other. No online research. If you've got questions for Mr. Chia, you'll get a chance to ask them. We'll get more note cards during the break. But before that, we'll see if the defense attorneys have questions for Mr. Chia. Enjoy your break. We will see you 205. All right, you all can be seated. Um, the medical bill issue, Mr. Huntley, was that that bill you you had in there had currently owed something to the, if it didn't say late or penalties, but I don't know that it was entirely consistent with what we had agreed to. In my mind, no harm, no foul it was up there for two seconds. We just are gonna need to agree as a group what it looks like before it goes back to the jury. It's in evidence, but it may need to be redacted. And I, and I spoke with the defense counsel about this, and that's why I entered plaintiff's exhibit seven, so they can come out. Great. That may be the way that um, that issue is is addressed. I just um, didn't want to prevent you from getting on the record what you want to. Um, I saw it. We got it off the screen. I didn't think we needed to do the sidebar or break before we got to this break point. Mr. Williams, anything more you want to get on the record in connection with that medical bill? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure my objection was on the record and that we had talked about the medical bills being redacted as the outstanding balances and whatnot. Um, and the court picked up on it quickly. Thank you for the court for taking out the screen. Um, but, you know, that was an issue we talked about in motions and limiting, and it still got flashed up on the screen. Okay. The jury. Well, and, and to Mr. Hunt's point, he did tell me that he planned to introduce the summary, yep. which is five. seven which is fine, but at no point in time did I think he was gonna flash up the bill on, in front of the jury for all to see. Okay. So I think that was definitely prejudicial. Okay. Um, you all need to keep track of what might need to be redacted for things that are going out with the jury. Those records are in evidence. I don't know whether they go out with the jury or not. There may be parts that do or don't. If that bill is going out, we would need to discuss redaction. I won't proactively intervene to say, hey, this better be redacted or not, but just keep keep tabs on that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Huntley, anything on behalf of Mr. Chia before we break for lunch? No, Okay. Um, do you have other witnesses to call after Mr. Chia? Yes, Dr. Kupali. Okay. Um, and he'll be here in time? He should be here in time. Okay. Um, Mr. Williams, Mr. Ham, anything we need to get on the record before lunch? No. Do you plan on cross-examining um, Mr. Chia? I do. Okay, so that'll be what we do next. Um, and I forgot to mention this. It doesn't sound like it's relevant, um, the way this case is gonna unfold. Should Mr. Huntley decide to call your client to cross her, mm -hmm. you are free to direct her during Mr. Huntley's presentation of his case. You can also recall her in your case in chief if you put on a case in chief, as long as you don't go over all the same stuff. But I've got the authority to authorize it. It makes it flow so much better for the jury 
to say defense may direct their client mm -hmm. if called for cross in plaintiff's case. But it doesn't sound like that's going to happen. Fault's not at issue here. Uh, but just in case things shift, know that you'll be able to do that. Sounds okay. good. Thank you, Al. All right. We'll be um, on break for lunch. Please be back here in about 45 minutes. Okay. Sure. Will the Thanks. courtroom be open or closed during lunch? I don't know. Will the courtroom be open? Uh, well, I, plan, I was planning on working in here, but. Okay. So I can leave and then come back? Yeah. Okay. The courtroom will be open. All right. Whatever he says. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Much quick, I'll be fine. I'll let your hand answer the question. No, I'll just, I'll just uh, say go ahead and get something for you and come on back. Okay, so. so.
looks like Wilhelm did. Wow, that's old. Isn't that rude? I think that's rude. Yeah. Because that's old school. To go in any bag. Yes. And you know what's really wrong? You and I, because you feel she's right home. Oh, so let's see this a piece. Yes. I'm Thank you. 
How you doing? All right.
things about it.
I got to bring uh, some paper out. I'll be right back. Thank 
Okay. Uh, we are trying to find our client. Be okay. Right back. All right, Ms. Rivers, you ready? Are they good? Okay. How come you're letting them in? Are they buzzing and not getting in, or you're just hanging out there to be friendly? All right. Okay. You don't charge them, do you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They're good? Okay. Mr. Huntley, anything before the jurors come in? I don't have anything. Else. Okay. Mr. Chia, you can come back up to the witness stand. Please. Mr. Williams, anything? Uh, nothing, Your Honor. And Mr. Ham? No, Your Honor. Just so I don't ask you guys questions, um, I don't need to. Will you both be examining um, Mr. Chia or just one of you? And if both, who's going first? Mr. Williams will be examining Mr. Chia. If anything is needed to be brought out after he's done, then I may ask a couple of questions. I doubt it, uh, but that's, okay. that is a possibility. Sure, I'll try to remember to check with you. If I don't and I say any redirect, please interrupt me. Say, wait, there are more questions from the defense. All right, All right. great. Let's bring the jurors in, please.
All the way down. Don't if you don't. Oh, I guess you, that can be empty. We will fill up. So that's great. You can leave that one empty. Someone can sit right there instead. So we fill up thirteen of the chairs. Look at that. All right. Great. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you had a good lunch. Is it hot out now? Yes, I think tomorrow is supposed to be 100. Um, so you're welcome for keeping you in a nice air conditioned space. Um, we'll keep you nice and cool. Um, thank you for being on time. We are going to turn now to see if Mr. Williams, on behalf of Ms. Santana, has any questions in the form of cross-examination for Mr. Chia. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chia. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Brian Williams, and nice to meet you. Got some questions for you, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, you testified on direct that you've been involved in four total accidents in your life. Isn't that right? That's correct. Okay. And you mentioned that you were involved in an accident in 2013. Isn't that right? That's correct. And you said it was a minor accident? That's correct. And you used to say no injuries? That's correct. And you didn't get any treatment, right? That's correct. All right, that's what you testified to on direct, isn't it? That's correct. All right. Isn't it true that after that 2013 accident, you went to the emergency room and got treatment for a neck injury? Um, I can recall it. You can't recall that? Uh, Let's see if I can refresh your recollection. And of course, we would object to the introduction of this exhibit. Have moved it. Well, he hasn't moved it in yet. So I will make sure if he um, tenders it to hear from you. Um, right now, we seem to be in the recollection refreshing mode. Okay. Uh, Defendant exhibit A, sir, turn the, the page. Look at the top there. At the top, you got your name and date of birth. That's correct. We move down to the middle page. You read that title for yourself. Starting with March 24, 2013. Let me know when you're finished, sir. Sure. 
Well, I've seen the document. It bears my name and date of birth, but I, I truly can't uh, recollect. So that doesn't refresh your recollection? No, sir. This time, Your Honor, move to introduce the Plaintiff's Exhibit A. And if Any objection to the admission of Plaintiff's A? Yes, there is an objection. Um, this document, there's been no foundation laid on this document, um, where it came from, what it purports to contain, mm -hmm. or any of those items. All right, Mr. Williams, basis for admitting A. Uh, Defendant's Exhibit A, Your Honor, is a portion of a certified document from uh, Aetna Health Insurance for uh, Mr. Chia. It, uh, well, before you narrate what it is, because it's not in evidence, how does either A or the larger universe that you might need to introduce, how does that come in? Well, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Chia just testified that he had never been involved, uh, excuse me, he had never sustained any injuries on 2013 accident. He never treated for anything. Well, 23 accident, this document disproves that testimony. Okay, but how does that make it admissible? Um, you've, you've shown it to him. He claims it doesn't refresh his recollection. Um, I think you had a dead end unless you've got another basis to admit it. I've got a certification that is true and accurate document. Your Honor. Meaning a business record certification. Okay. Um, can you share that with Mr. Huntley? I, I do have that. Oh, okay. He should be pretty flexible with business record certifications. I am, Your Honor. Okay. However, this, this document still has not been authenticated and no foundation has been laid as far as whether Mr. Chia, who has already testified, does not recognize this treatment and or this provider that Mr. Williams is trying to enter into evidence. But what you have, Mr. Williams, is a certification from a custodian of business record saying that this document is something that's regularly kept in the course of whatever entity's business. Correct. Okay. And is this something that was in discovery or is something that you're using in rebuttal at this time? Using as an impeachment, Your Honor. Okay. Got it. Um, I'll admit it. Move to publish, Your Honor. That would be plain, uh, defense A. Correct. Move to publish, Your Honor. Okay. Do you, you know how to do that? We'll find out. So. Okay. All right. This is just your first. That's why I was asking. Right. We'll, we will be, uh, we'll find out. It's looking promising. Okay. Yeah, let me see if I can. Sorry, let me. I apologize, Your Honor. This is my first time doing this. <coughs> And I apologize to the jury as well. Defendant's Exhibit A, Mr. Chia, the document I just handed you, there's a certification for uh, Atlanta Health Insurance there on top. You see that? That's right. All right, moving on to page number two here at the top, and I'll highlight it. Got your name. Date of birth, is that correct? That's correct. And this is shows says it's our records show the following history of your medical and dental claim submissions and detail those claims. You see that top? That's correct. Okay, I'll highlight that. I scroll down here, middle of the page. March 23rd, 2013. You went to the emergency room, next brain, motor vehicle accident. That's what it says, doesn't it? It does, but I don't truly uh, recall it because Edna, uh, my wife holds that uh, insurance. So um, we have other family members that are need. So if they were um, in an accident, they might use that same card um, to get treatment. So. I truly don't recollect being uh, uh, in this accident. Um, the uh, the vehicle is not specified for me to truly know if uh, it was the Mercedes or not. So truly, I don't recollect. That's fine, but this isn't your doesn't doesn't have your wife's name on it, does it? Well, there are four names. Yeah, your, your name's at the top of this document. Your wife's name's not on top of the document. Can you scroll? I, sure. We I'm sorry. want to see what's at the top. Sure. Okay. 
So your name's at the top of this document, isn't it? That's correct. All right. It says records for your history, correct? That's correct. All right. And in here, it's got a record here, March 24, 2013, you went to the emergency room after a motor vehicle accident for a neck injury. Isn't that correct? The document states that, but I can't recollect getting involved in that accident. So if you... All right. He's, he said he doesn't recall. You've got the document in. Uh, you, you. you can go to the next thing. Thank you, Your Honor. Now turn to the accident with my client. Uh, that happened back in May 5th of 2020. You said it was a very hard impact, right? That's right. All right. But isn't it true that you didn't complain of any injury to my client at the scene? Can you repeat that? Sure. At the scene of the accident, you did not, you did not complain of any injury to my client. Isn't that correct? Are you saying I did not speak to her about my injury? N no. My question was, at the scene of the accident of May 5th, 2020, uh -huh. you did not complain of any injury to my client. Isn't that correct? Uh, we never really uh, got into any conversation, apart from uh, exchanging uh, um, uh, documents, uh, insurance, uh, driving license information. But during your interaction with Ms. Santana, did you ever tell her, oh, by the way, my back hurts, or whatever you might have said about injuries? Uh, no, sir. And you didn't tell the passenger in your vehicle that you were injured, did you? Uh, we are not allowed to have any conversation with our passengers. So uh, I wouldn't have uh, uh, discussed that issue with him. Right, Is that so really a Lyft policy that the Lyft drivers aren't supposed to talk to you? No, I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't engage in any conversation with our uh, passengers. <laughs> I'm going to tell some Lyft drivers that sometimes. <laughs> right, I think that's pretty unusual. Uh, but moving on, you didn't, uh, when you called 911, you didn't make any complaint of injury when you called 911. Isn't that correct? No, when I called 911, I was not given the opportunity to state um, uh, further information because uh, the operator said the police will not come on the scene because of the COVID-19. Right. But you didn't ask for an ambulance or anything like that when you were on the phone, did you? I was not given the opportunity to, uh, to go into that. No, that's not my question. My question was, you did not ask for an ambulance or complaint of injury when you called 911. Isn't that correct? I was not given the opportunity to go into that conversation because uh, the operator told me um, the police would not be on scene that we should extend, uh, exchange the uh, Objective information. Objective not responsive, Your Honor. So, Mr. Chia, you are free to explain your answer in any way you want, but you need to make sure you're answering the question first. It could be yes or no or maybe, and then you get to explain it. Mr. Williams doesn't get to interrupt you. Um, once you ask your question one more time, make sure you answer the question and then you can explain it however you want. Okay. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Question was, uh, when you called the police, you didn't ask for any type of ambulance or emergency service to come to the scene. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Right? And you didn't tell the person on the phone that you were injured. Isn't that correct? That's correct. In fact, you don't recall telling anyone at the scene that you were injured. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And I think you testified that the pain you felt you didn't feel till the following day. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. So there'd be no reason for your medical records from ICA to indicate that you had a sustained or you felt immediate pain at the scene. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat what insurance? Sure. So there's no reason for your medical records of ICA to say that you had immediate pain at the scene. Isn't that correct? I did state that I, I obtained the injuries from that accident. Not my question. My question was, there's no reason for your ICA records to say that you had immediate pain at the scene. Isn't that correct? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Let me uh, share a few plans exhibit two, which was introduced earlier. All right. Your ICO records that were introduced by your attorney. 
See the first day of the service is May 6, 2020. That's the day following the accident, isn't it? Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And under there, there's the details of the collision and your patient history. You see that? You mean the highlighted uh, text? Well, we're going to get to that, but it says details of the collision and patient okay. history. You see that? I've got highlighted there. Stop for a sec. I think you need to mute your machine. Oh, so sorry. All right. <clears throat> Uh, well, it says I'm no, muted. It's Mr. Hunt needs. But I just muted it. We're good. Okay. okay. Sorry. All right. And the highlighted text there says, got highlighted there. You said your vehicle sustained extensive damage in the collision. Isn't that right? That's right. All right. And you immediately fall in the collision. You experience pain in the following areas neck, low back, and head. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. So that doesn't make sense because you told me in this jury that you didn't have any pain at the scene. Isn't that right? That's right. All right. And on top of that, uh, and we'll get to this a little bit further along, uh, this record indicates that you did not miss any time from work. Isn't that correct? Uh, what page is that? Same page, right there, highlight. That's not correct statement. That's not correct. So that's incorrect. It's not correct. Okay. All right. So, these are your certified records. These are the records that your attorney put in. This is incorrect. Uh, this is an interpretation of somebody's uh, uh, um, writing. So it, it's not a direct reporting from me because I wouldn't state that I did not miss work when I was received, uh, receiving treatment and I had no car. <clears throat> Uh, Jax is non responsive. Let me re ask the question. These are your records. Your attorney put them in. You just testified that you felt no pain at the scene and you told no one uh, that you had pain at the scene. Yet and still, these records show that you complained of immediate pain. Isn't that correct? Well, that's what the record shows. Right. And these are your records. And you're saying that this is incorrect. He's, he's testified to that, but then you objected when he said it's incorrect. So he said it's incorrect. Okay. Now, you treated it like, we've gone over this before. I'm sorry, let me. Uh, keep scrolling here because there's another portion here of this record I want you to take a look at. I apologize. Give me a second. Here we go. Uh, you testified on direct that on May 12, 2020, you treatment to ICA, uh, that you weren't able to work. But this record also shows that you have been able to work with the pain in your neck, in your low back. That's May 12, 2020. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's just what this, uh, the document stated. All right, and that's based on what you told the folks at ICA, isn't it? No. No, not correct. Okay. Your last, I'm sorry. Can I say something? So um, you can say things in response to questions, but not just generally, I've had a thought about something that I want to share. So um, you need to wait till this next question. And if what you want to say is responsive to that question, you're free to say it. Yeah, it is. Well, he hasn't asked the question yet, so let's let him ask the question. Uh -huh. All right. And you stopped treating at ICA. That was June 29th, 2020, right? That's correct. That was your last day of treatment, correct? That's correct. And you reported to the folks at ICA about your pain level. Isn't that correct? That the pain was low? Yeah. That's correct. All right. In fact, you testified on direct. I'm sorry. Okay. that your neck pain was a one out of 10. Isn't that correct? Uh, yeah, the record states that, yes. But that's what you also testified to on direct, isn't it? I can't recall it. Can't recall? All right. You told the folks at ICA during your last visit that your neck pain was a one out of 10. Isn't that correct? I, I can't recall. Uh, can't recall. It, no. Okay. And you told the folks at ICA that your low back pain was a two out of 10. Isn't that correct? I can't recall. Can't recall. Okay. Uh, do you recall telling us during your deposition 
that your pain was mild after you finished treating at ICA? Uh, that would be correct. Okay, that's what you told us during your deposition. And so you were fine, excuse me, not fine, excuse me, let me, that, you were on your way to being fine after you finished treating at ICA, isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay, in fact, you uh, testified that uh, the only reason that you went and treated at comprehensive spine care and had that disectomy was due to the second accident involving, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but in August of 2020, isn't that correct? That's not correct. That's not correct. Isn't it true that through your attorney, you made a demand following the August 2020, August 2020 accident, indicating that your injuries from comprehensive pain and spine were directly caused by the August 2020 accident? Is it that true? Uh, can you rephrase that? Please? Sure. Isn't it true that through your attorney, you made a demand asserting that the disectomy, the uh, neck pain, the back pain was all related to the August 2020 accident? Isn't that true? I can't recall. Can't recall. Okay. If you take a look at that. Second page for me, second, third page actually. Let me know when you're done reviewing that. What page please? Uh, the second page and third page of that exhibit is actually marked as page 26 and 27 at the bottom. Okay, I'm on the 26. All right, and please review that quietly and let me know when you're done reviewing it. Yeah, can you tell me what section you're referring to? The whole thing. Read the whole thing. Yes, I have read it. All right, does that refresh your recollection? <clears throat> Why don't you ask your question for which you're seeking refreshment um, to see if reading that helped, Mr. Sure. Chia? I'll repeat my question. 
Mr. Chia, uh, my question was, you made a demand through your attorney asserting that the injuries and treatment the comprehensive spine of care were related to the August 2020 accident. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. And it, that demand, there's nothing about the May 2020 accident. Isn't that correct? <laughs> Well, it's not stated here, so that would be correct. All right. And in this demand, through your attorney, you indicated that you sustained, from the August 2020 accident, you sustained disabling injuries. Isn't that correct? Or excuse me, de debilitating injuries. Isn't that correct? Uh, I'm trying to figure out where the, uh, that one cell. So. If you go uh, third paragraph, last one, uh, second to last sentence. <laughs> That's correct. And due to those debilitating injuries, you had to have disectomy. Isn't that correct? <coughs> uh, that's not correct. Part uh, the text on this page it does not list what you are saying. It doesn't listen to what I'm saying. That's All right. All right. Move to introduce uh, defense exhibit number D, uh, D. Excuse me, exhibit D. Any objection to the admission of exhibit D? No objection. D is admitted. All right. Move to publish, Your Honor. You may publish. Thank you. All right. This is a certified record from Progressive, Defendant's Exhibit D. This is a letter dated from Holston and Huntley, your attorney, dated January 8th, 2021. You see that? That's correct. All right. And it's got your name. It's got your name highlighted. You see that? That's correct. And it's got date of accident, August 25th, 2020. That's correct. All right. <clears throat> In the paragraph I've highlighted there, so it's due to collision at the bottom, due to collision uh -huh. of August 25th, 2020, Mr. Chia sustained excruciating pain which made it impossible for him to participate in normal daily activities. And his injuries sustained in this collision will require further conservative treatment from a licensed medical professional. As a result of his injuries and debilitating pain and suffering, he demands $25,000. A little bit further up says that you got a list of all the injuries you sustained in this accident. <clears throat> Including a traumatic rupture of the lumbar disc, sprains, ligaments, cervical sprains in the lumbar, headaches. Mm -hmm. As a result of these debilitating injuries, you had to have a disectomy. And your damages are $225,600. Uh, $24.20. Nowhere in this demand at all do you indicate that the May 2020 accident caused your injuries. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And isn't it true that you were not recommended to have a disectomy until after the August 25th, 2020 accident? Is that correct? I'm not sure. You're not sure. Okay. All right. Tell you what. Knowing that ICA were you treated after the uh, accident in May of 2020, recommended a disectomy, did they? I wouldn't uh, know about that because um, I never had any conversation uh, regarding that with any person at ICO. Are you saying that you never spoke with anyone at ICO? I spoke to regarding my treatment, okay. but not what you are saying that I did have a discussion or recommended that I should have that uh, operation. Well, that's my question. No one at ICA ever recommended a disectomy oh, after yeah. the May 2020 accident, correct? That's correct. All right. It was only after the August 2020 accident that you recommend to have a disectomy. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And it's per your demand that August 2020 accident caused you debilitating pain and suffering. And that's why you need to have a disectomy. Isn't that correct? That's correct.
Right. We talked on direct about time that you missed from work as a result of the accident with my client. Uh, you remember giving deposition testimony in this case. Do you recall when we took your deposition? That's correct. That was back on August 12, 2021? That's correct. And you swore to tell the truth in that deposition as well? That's correct. All right. Do you recall testifying that you reached the point after you treated ICA that you'd go back to work? Can you rephrase the question? Sure. You testify in your deposition that you got to the point where your injuries had healed enough where you went back to work. <laughs> Isn't that correct? Uh, I can't recall saying those exact words. Your Honor, can you um, open the deposition transcript, the sealed deposition transcript to hand it to Mr. Chu? Sure, I'm doing Thank this you. in a while. Here you go, Mr. Chia. I think that um, Mr. Williams is gonna direct you to a particular page in there. That's correct. Would you turn to page 36 for me? Right. And read line six through 21. I'm sorry. Read line six through 21 silently to yourself. Yes, I've, I've read it, so. Does that refresh your recollection? That's correct. Okay, so it's true that after a point, after you got done treating ICA, that you felt well enough to go back to working for Lyft. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, the time that you said you missed working at Lyft, and I think you testified that you Miss May, June, and July. Is that right? That's correct. All right, you went back to work in August. Is that correct? That's correct. So three months. Is that correct? That's correct. You recall testifying that you averaged roughly five thousand dollars a month for working for Lyft. That's correct. That's what you testified to. So when your attorney put up the uh, exhibit, I think it was Exhibit Seven. Uh, let me make sure that's correct. The tax returns or the summary? The uh, summary, Your Honor. I believe it was the. Well, I think there was the tax returns and at the end of the tax returns, there was a summary of the lost wages. Yeah, that's six. That's six. So when your attorney put that up there saying that you just lost wages of $21,000, that was incorrect. Isn't that right? Uh, that would be correct because of the uh, differences uh, between 20, uh, 20, 20, uh, 2019 and 2020. Well, wait a minute. If you average $3,000 a month and you miss three months, that's $15,000. Not $21,000, right? Uh, I have to work out that calculation to, to know that, to ascertain. No, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit further. You did not bring any documents from Lyft indicating uh, the, any of the services you provided before or after the accident, is that correct? I'm sorry, what services are you referring to? Lyft, you get paid from Lyft, right? You're a Lyft driver. Yes. All right, uh -huh. they keep documentation of when you worked, how long you worked, what you got paid, is that correct? Yeah, at the end of the year, they give us those uh, documentation. All right, and you didn't bring any of that with you, did you? Today? Yeah. No, I didn't. No. So, 
you got no documentation showing that you lost wages from Lyft, correct? No, sir. Correct. You testified that you averaged roughly $5,000, but nothing to show for that. Is that correct? My tax return shows that. All right. It shows that you averaged $5,000 a month? That's correct. All right. Uh, we'll let tax returns speak for that. Yourself, but you have nothing from Lyft showing that your tax returns, uh, excuse me, nothing from Lyft showing that you averaged $5,000 a month, do you? From Lyft? Correct. The tax return shows that. I said you have nothing from Lyft. Showing that. Isn't that correct? Those figures were obtained from Lyft. I'm sorry? Those figures were obtained from Lyft. Let me try it one more time. You have no documentation here today from Lyft showing that you average $5,000 a month as a Lyft driver. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. And you testified that at max you missed three months of work. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. So the allegation that you lost $21,000 of lost wages is incorrect, isn't it? I have to work the calculation. I would have to actually uh, You'd like to what? Um, I, I would like to clarify on some of the questions that he's asking because uh, I have further information okay. related to what he's saying. So the way that may happen is Mr. Huntley may ask you some questions um, or in response to any additional questions from Mr. Williams, you may be able to talk about that, but you've given the answer so far to the questions that have been asked. Um, so you don't get, there's not an add on okay. method. Okay, thank you, my love. You're welcome. Sorry, Your Honor, one moment, I might be done. Okay. Just a couple more, or maybe just one more. So, Mr. Chair, you recall that you testified earlier on direct, and your attorney asked you, you said that uh, you didn't sustain any injury in the August 2020 accident. Isn't that correct? I can't recall. Can't recall. Okay. All right. But clearly, uh, you made a demand. I think that was Phoenix Exhibit D that indicates otherwise. Isn't that correct? Which is D, please. Put it back on screen for you. That's the man we went over earlier. That indicates otherwise, doesn't it? That's correct. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Ham, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. Any redirect, Mr. Huntley? Yes, Your Honor. But before I get started, would you share anything you have? I think I more note cards for you guys. Is it already okay, this one. Thank you, sir.
should be coming to you. He emailed you D so you can put it up. Exactly. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yes, sir. And also with, um, I think it's defendants exhibit the Aetna record. A. A. I need to add to that record. It's about a 210 page document. How so why don't we talk about that during a juror break? All right. But I, I say that to say that I want to discuss the entire document. The entire document wasn't admitted. Only one page of the 210 page document. Now, okay. I don't know if you wanted me to enter the entire document or be able to discuss that entire document. However you want to do it. Um, it. It sounds like there's a business record certification for all 200 plus pages. Um, you are able to admit parts of it, just like Mr. Williams did. Or you could say, let's give the jurors a big present and then you give them 200 pages. It's really up to you as to how you want to navigate it. I will do you have them with you? I do not have them with you. That was the issue. Do you have them digitally? So, I have them digitally. Okay. So if you need them to examine, to redirect Mr. Chia, you can do that now, um, assuming there's no objection to having, I think what we would do is just keep it as exhibit A, defense exhibit A, but we'd make it the entirety of, if it's Aetna, the Aetna records. I'll need Mr. Williams and Mr. Ham to agree to that. But if, if all of Aetna is going to come in, let's just keep it as defense A. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can now use your digital version and then we'll figure out a way to get to Ms. Rivers and ultimately to the jury, the 200 plus pages. Okay, perfect. All right. But let me make sure, Mr. Williams, any objection to that? Uh, no objection. Okay, then let's do it that way. So defense exhibit A, is now the entire set of records that Aetna provided pursuant to their business record certification. Yes, sir. Okay, and, and that's exactly um, where we will start. So, Mr. Chia, um, defense counsel showed you a portion of this record, which we just discussed. We're going to show you the entire record, as you can see at the top of the page. It's 210 pages, correct? That's correct. Now, in these 210 pages, uh, for the sake of time, I won't ask you to go through it, but if you went through 210 pages, there would be no other mention of any type of accident. And you can scroll through to confirm this. If you're- Well, well he can't He doesn't have through. a copy. You, does you can scroll well, let's, through. Let's, let's go through it. Um, <clears throat> and, and we'll start, you know, a certification. So he talked about this being your treatment record, correct? And I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna come back to that question, but let's move on right here. The, you confirm that this is your Aetna, Aetna record. Yes. yes? Yes. Now we also talked about some other records that have been entered into evidence here. And some of those things had discrepancies in them, did they not? Yes. So it's quite possible that Aetna record could have a discrepancy in it as well. That's possible. And you also don't put together the records or write any of the reports that goes into the record. Is that correct? That's correct. So we're gonna go back to this and, and we're, we're gonna go through and for the sake of time, you know, we're gonna say this summary, if you'll go to the middle of the page, procedure code di diagnosis, that's what you get for every treatment that you have. And this goes back to 2012. So from 2012, and, and we'll go through this as, as swiftly as I can. Um, there is only one mention of a, another accident.
And here we are on page 18. And you say, here it is, emergency department visit. You, do you recall going to any emergency room for treatment of this kind of injury? No, I can't uh, recall, I can't. Um, did you go anywhere else? If you went to the emergency room, that would indicate that you were injured. That's correct. Did you go anywhere else to support this record? Uh, no, sir. So if we went through it, and I think for the sake of argument, we'll go just from maybe March of 13 to the end of 13. We're just talking about this particular time because we're talking about this particular accident. Um, but we'll go through, you know, we got March of 13, April of 13, down here, you know, it talks about some other issues that you were going through and we won't get into those, but it doesn't mention anything about a follow-up for an accident, does it? No, it doesn't. And then we are in, now we're in June of 13, no follow-ups, no other indication of any kind of injury that you sustained from an accident. Is there any indication of neck pain, back pain, or any other type of pain from an accident? That's correct. And we're still in June. Now we're in July. Do you see anything indicating any type of back pain or any involvement in any motor vehicle accident? That's correct. And now we're in October, still no indication. That's correct. Still in October here. Still in October, no indication, a lot of treatment. It, it, it seems odd that there's no indication of any other. So don't provide commentary, just I ask understand. questions. I understand, Your Honor. Do you see anything else indicating any involvement in a motor vehicle accident here? That's correct. We're moving into November. Do you see any indication of any involvement of any injury or any other motor vehicle accident? That's correct. So the, and the, now the, we're hold in. On, stop. The question is, do you see anything more? And you're saying that's correct. So the either you do see or you don't see, or I don't know. But saying that's correct is actually a non-responsive answer to your lawyer's question. I mean. Uh, there's no uh, entry uh, in this report that indicated that um, I had reported for neck, back pain, or any other injury that has sustained from a motor accident. Okay. That's a responsive answer. Thank you. And, and so we went through those records, and now we're into January of 2014. So from the time that we saw in March of 2013 through January here, January 13 of 2014, is there any other indication of any treatment for a motor vehicle accident? No, there's no indication uh, relating to any uh, motor injuries. Does that indicate to you that you had any other treatment for an injury from that motor vehicle accident in 2013? No, sir. We, have you seen any other record from any provider that stated that you came there for treatment for a motor vehicle accident no, in 2013? Sir, no. Now we're gonna go back. Um, he asked you about when you went to ACA on your first visit. And, and we kind of talked about that originally. And, and we specifically tried to clear up the record to indicate to the jury what they were saying. Now, and, and I'm gonna pull this back up. Um, two. Oops, that's not it. All right, this should be a uh, It 
that we talked about your first day of the visit. Now, he highlighted a portion that said immediately following the collision. Now, does immediately following the collision in your view, can let me ask this strike that. Explain to the jury what immediately means or what you meant by immediately. Well, uh, uh, I would mean to say that immediately after this uh, incident, I had no, uh, I did not notice anything, but when I got home, uh, the, that is when I noticed that I had pains at my lower back, neck, and I have headache. So, but at the scene, I did not uh, notice that. So when I got back home, that is when I, I noticed that. So this was once again, the day after the accident. So at this time, had you missed any time from work? Yes. And how much time had you missed from work? From May 5th until you went and got treatment at Acre? From May 5th to, to May, May 6th. 6th. Correct. Uh, I missed work because I, I, I had gone to Acre to, to get my treatment. I didn't have car because it was damaged due to the accident. And I wouldn't have been able to go back to work because the lift will not accept uh, a car that has been an accident. So there's no way for me to have uh, gone to work the next day because I didn't have any other car. That was my only car. So, this was just an inaccurate assessment of what you said to Egg at that time? That's correct. Now, as a Lyft driver, do your, do your wages vary? Yeah, the wages vary depending on the, how many uh, hours you have uh, put in and uh, how much uh, bonuses that you have received. So would you say the tax returns, would that, because your wages vary, would your overall yearly tax return be more indicative of what you've earned for the year as opposed to on a month to month basis? Yes, uh, that would be correct because um, it is the tally uh, of your monthly wages that is total at the end of the year. So the amount, that's indicated as the total uh, income tax, that would be accurate because it is the tally that uh, is gotten from the monthly uh, earnings. So there is a difference between your 2019 tally, as you called it, and your 2020 tally. Is there any other reason why you weren't able to work other than being injured in the May 20th crash? Can you rephrase that? Yes. From 2019, you had income of the 77,000 and, and I'll put it back up for you here. Yeah. So the 2019 income, 77,495. That's your total income from the year. You might've made 1,000 in January, 12,000 in December. Is that fair? That's correct. But the total of the 77,495 is the total of what you made January through December. That's correct. So the same would hold true for 2020, correct? That's correct. You could have made 1,000 in January and then, you know, 12,000 in December. That's correct because I mean, um, month by month, it's different because it depends on how many hours I will put in to, to work. So the more hours I put in, uh, the more I make. And uh, if there are bonuses or tips, then that will also affect uh, my uh, total or total yearly. Now, 
Because of the difference, is there any reason other than you missing work because of the car crash that caused you to go from 77,000 to 56,000? In uh, 20, go ahead. Yeah, that would be correct because I, I did not work during those uh, three months. I was receiving treatment and I had no car during those uh, three months. And if you'll give me a second, I need to uh, pull up the exhibit D, but I'm going to go there next. And I think. Okay. Dr. Pupalo might be here as well. Okay. He should wait outside. Okay. Okay, so now the, the defendant showed you another exhibit and it was a demand you sent because of the August incident, correct? That's correct. You stated earlier that you were injured in the August incident, correct? That's correct. You also indicated that your injuries from May were made worse from the August incident, is that correct? That's correct. Now, they sh the defense showed you about two pages, and this is a 13-page a document, but I'm going to take you to page, uh, let's see. Oops. Is this right? Hold on. All right, because I got something, the document you had gave me is, you got progressive. Let me just see if it's different. It's no medical record attached to the one that you just came out to. Yeah, this is unmarked. I'm sorry. This is not exhibit D. What is that? This is a separate exhibit I chose not to use. Okay. So this exhibit isn't into evidence yet, but I, I will enter it. And you provided this earlier. Do you need to see it again? So is this going to be plaintiff's eight or is it already labeled? No, it is not labeled. This okay. will be plaintiff. Uh, can we make it plaintiff nine? I have another. Make it any number you want. Plaintiff nine. Other than one to seven. I'm going to show you a document here. And the defense chose not to enter this. <laughs> Uh, what any particular things? Yeah, I have. Do you recognize that as the demand you reviewed as definitive exhibit B? Okay. 
So I'm confused. Yeah. What you want to have as plaintiffs nine is defendants D? They're partially. They're different. Yeah, they're different. It's partially. The same. Okay. Well, how would you describe what your client's looking at right now? He's looking at, first, that's the demand letter. He's looking at page. Yeah. Two. Those are the same. However, the subsequent pages is his metal record. Comprehensive Different from plaintiff's three, which is comprehensive spine medical records. It is the same, but it's just the one uh, the defendants attached. Okay. So there's nothing in plaintiff's nine that's not also in defendants D or plaintiff's three. Is that correct? It's a piece of Defendants D and a piece of plaintiffs three. It's a it's a piece of defendants D, Your Honor. Yeah, D. Uh, defendants D was the record from Progressive. I I, turned, I put in a portion of that. What he's looking at is another portion of that same record. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to understand what it is, Mr. Chia. Do you recognize any of that or not? I uh, I recognize the um, the Ted. Uh, sorry, the. Uh, the second page. Okay. But not the other stuff. That's that's correct. Okay. From what I was uh, presented with. Meaning it's not the same. It's not the same. So we're going to move to enter in. Okay. Plaintiff's exhibit nine. Plaintiff's exhibit nine. Any objection to plaintiff's nine? No objections. Admitted. So plaintiff's defendant, plaintiff, sorry, defendant's exhibit D, plaintiff's exhibit 9 are, are similar in some respect. Um, would you agree? Yes, I do. Yeah, pages 1 or page 2, that's the same. And then page 3, that's the same. But page 4 is a little different. That's correct. It goes into a police report and uh, plaintiff's exhibit nine goes to your medical record. Companies as well. That's correct. Now, you did go to companies as well for treatment after the August incident, right? That's correct. And I don't have a digital copy, so I'm, I'm going to have you to read to the jury what you told them about your treatment or why you were there for treatment. And I'm going to direct you to review problem section. You start there and read these lines to the jury. Okay. Um, it says uh, review, it has review problems, then injury of neck, onset. August 26, 2020, neck pain due to previous MVA, 5, 2020, is abated recently by rear end, MVA, 8, 26, Impairing ADLS of driving, walking, lifting. C MR 9 20 20. Okay. So I will help you with this. Okay. So based on this, and I'm just going to read really read it so the jury can get a clear understanding of which, <laughs> what you said. So you told comprehensive you had injury of the neck, onset was. 826-2020, neck pain due to a previous MVA from 52020, exacerbated recently by rear end MVA on August 26, 2020. That's correct. So in summation, you told your doctors that you were involved in another accident, that you were involved in an accident in May. Correct. That's correct. That you were involved in another accident in August. That's correct. And that the accident in August made your injuries from May. That's correct. 
And after you told the doctor this, is that when you had your disectomy? That's correct. Now, in the August incident, since the defendant has brought this up, that defendant paid their portion of the injury they caused. Is that correct? That's correct. Has the defendant paid her portion of your injury that she caused? No, she did not pay. Those are all the questions I have, Your Honor. Any recross? No, it's not, Your Honor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Mr. Chia, now's the time to write them down. We've got a big stack of cards, so don't be shy. If you don't have any questions, don't write anything down. I'll just give you a second if there is anything, and we'll get Deputy Gordon to collect those cards. Oh, right. And please only write on one side of the card. We have as many cards as you need, but a uh, court reporter who has to photocopy these things, it's a pain to photocopy both sides. So just write on one card. You can put multiple questions on one card, but only on one side. And do your best not to write like I do so we can read it. There you are. Thank you. All right. If you pass your cards to one end or the other, Deputy Gordon will collect them. And counsel, if you, once I get these, Did it? Oh, one more. Take your time. There we go. Thank you. Uh, one of you writes worse than I do. All right, counsel, if you'll come to this door, I'm gonna let you out back. We'll talk about this.
Push. Mr. Chia, a few more questions. Okay. First, um, when did you first get your driver's license um, to, that allowed you to drive in Georgia? Uh, my current uh, uh, license, which is not the first, but it's a renewal of my uh, other licenses, but this current one was uh, 2020. 2020. Okay, but when did you first get a driver's license in Georgia? This would be uh, over 10 years ago. Okay. You testified that you had a customer in the back of the red car you were driving in May of 2020. Is that, that, is that right? That's correct. Um, what happened to the cut? Was the customer injured um, when Ms. Santana's car struck your car? No, the customer was not injured. Because uh, if he was injured, he would have uh, made a claim to, to lift. And also, I could have uh, made that report because uh, we are uh, obliged to make uh, to report any accidents. So, when so you I reported your accident, it did not include a report that the customer was injured. Yes, because he did not say he was injured. Okay. So there was a, a discussion about an emergency room visit um, in August of. 
I think this question refers to the August emergency room. Oh no, this is the March 2013. You're right. That's what it says. You, your first accident when you were driving the Mercedes Benz um, in in uh, 2013. You you were shown, in fact, it may be in front of you right now, a document about going to an emergency room. Remember that document? Yes, I was shown the uh, document. Okay. To that. Do you remember anything? Um, about going to an emergency room or what would have happened there? Uh, uh, no, sir, because um, it, it, it's quite strange that um, this document here, uh, it, it appears to be a major of two documents because um, looking at the first part, it showed that uh, I have uh, I visited my doctor, Dr. Hood, so then right at the bottom here, it also says that I visited emergency, uh, had the emergency uh, visit. Dr. Hood is my primary doctor. How do you spell that doctor's name? H-O-O-D. Hood, okay. Uh, um, but my question is simply, do you recall anything about going to an emergency room in connection with the March 2013 automobile accident? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, how did you first discover that you had pain in your neck and your back after you got home after the accident involving Ms. Santana? So now we're in May of 2020. Yeah, when I got home and um, it was uh, evening time, I started experiencing pain. So it continued to the uh, next day. So then uh, I, dec I decided to seek for help okay when you say experiencing pain was that because if you moved in a certain way it hurt or just sitting still you felt pain uh it, it's both uh general pain because um i had um uh some difficulty uh getting out of bed comfortably and um i had like slight fever but i think that would be the headache <coughs> You mentioned that you took a few months off from driving for Lyft, the red car, you couldn't drive anymore. I guess ultimately you got this Dodge that we saw pictures of in the August accident. If you had been able to get a car sooner, let's say in June or July, would you have been able to go back to work? Okay. Um, the Dodge that um, is being mentioned I bought that Dodge when um, I had to pay, uh, when my, the Ottoma was paid off. So that was the money I used to, to buy the Dodge. Okay. So when I got the Dodge, even though I still had pain, I had to go to work because I have to make a living uh, to, to feed my family because I was the breadwinner for my family. So I had to work. Okay. Well, let me ask the question in a different way. Let's say on June 15th of 2020, I gave you a car. Judge McBurney, nice guy. Here's a car. You, your red car was totaled. Here's a car. Would you have gone back to work on June 15th? I understand you needed to get the money from the Altima to get the Dodge. Judge McBurney gives you a car. Wouldn't be as nice as a Dodge, but I give you a car. Would you go back to work? I would have gone because I would have needed to make a living uh, to, to feed my family. So I wouldn't have said I do doing nothing because um, I was brought up uh, to, to work hard. I believe in working hard and making a living. So I, I wouldn't have just uh, sat down idly doing nothing, even though um, I had that pain. So even though um, when I had the Dodge, I was still uh, driving still having the, uh, the pain because I couldn't just sit down uh, without any income coming in, uh, into my family. Okay. So I still have the pain right now, but I still, I'm still driving. All right. Thank you. Mr. Huntley, do you have any follow-up questions based on the questions that I just asked Mr. Chia? I don't have any follow-up questions. Thank you, Mr. Chia. <laughs> Mr. Williams, any questions? Uh, just one, Your Honor. 
Mr. Chia, just based on that last question that was being asked, the main reason why you didn't go back to work is because you didn't have a working car. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. If you had a working car the following day, you would have went back to work. Is that right? Of the May, uh, May accident. Uh, like I said, I'm the breadwinner for my family. So I will do anything to make a living for my family. If I don't work, don't eat. So I put myself through all those pains to make a living so that I can feed my family. Appreciate that, but just question was, day after the accident, if you had a working car, you would have went back to work. Is that right? That's right. All right, thank you. Nothing further, you All right, Mr. Chia, thank you for your testimony. You should leave all the documents that were handed to you right there. The lawyers will figure out what to do with them, and you can go back to council table, okay? Appreciate it. Next witness. Our next witness will be Dr. Pupala. Right, right hand. Testimony, should I get some points? Truth, all truth, and all truth. I do. Yeah, I'll see. For the record, can you please state and spell your first name? Last name is Pupala, P U P P A L A. First name is Vinaya, V I N A Y A. Dr. Pupala, I'm Judge McBurney. Nice to meet you. A couple things. Thank you for being here. Two, I need you to pull that chair that has no wheels a uh, lot closer to the microphone. Excellent. And then third and final, if you are comfortable removing your mask while you testify, that will greatly aid us in understanding what you have to say, but you're not required to do it. I am fine with that. Thank you. Mr. Huntley, your witness. Uh, Dr. Pupala, can you tell us what is your profession? I'm an interventional pain physician, and that entails uh, treating the underlying cause of pain for patients without resorting to the need for addictive medications that uh, essentially just mask the symptoms. Well, I imagine you didn't just wake up one day and begin to be able to provide that kind of treatment. Do you have any educational background that provides your ability to give patients that type of service? Yes, uh, I graduated from the Illinois Math and Science Academy and then went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, graduated with my bachelor's in science degree and then went to medical school at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. That was followed by a general surgery internship, followed by residency in anesthesiology, and then a fellowship, which is additional subspecialty training in pain medicine at Northwestern University. I then completed uh, board certification in both anesthesiology and pain medicine in 2013. So how long did it take you to obtain all of these certifications? So that would be four years of college, four years of medical school, and then five years of postgraduate training. And in your practice, tell us more about the type of injuries that you treat. Uh, we treat patients with any variety of uh, painful symptoms, whether that's neck pain, back pain, extremity pain. And for the patients that we treat that are uh, suffering pain as a result of injury, that could involve motor vehicle accidents. It could involve work-related injuries. Uh, it could involve falls, uh, any uh, uh, broad spectrum of those types of symptoms and mechanisms. So in your practice, what is the typical type of injury you find? Are there neck bulges, herniations, or what is your typical type of injury you find? 90% of what we do is predominantly spinally related. So that can involve disc herniations, disc bulges. It can involve uh, issues with the facet joints, which are the joints that allow the spine to articulate. Um, but uh, uh, those are the main types of issues that we encounter. Now, I know you went to all of this school, but I'm going to ask you to explain to the jury in a short 
time frame of what, what is a disc herniation? Sure, the disc is like a shock absorber for the spine. So imagine a jelly donut that comprises of basically a shock absorber so that it can cushion that uh, bone within the spine. And the disc uh, has an inner jelly inside of it. And when that jelly leaks out, that can be termed as a disc herniation. And that basically means that that uh, fluid filled center of the disc is uh, leaking and that jelly is comprised of inflammatory chemicals. So it's like battery acid it can irritate the nerve that can cause painful symptoms in the neck or the back that can also cause symptoms along the adjacent nerve. So it can cause pain going down the arm or down the leg. And typically when you see those types of injuries, how do you treat them? There's a different uh, uh, array of potential treatments. We can uh, try medications such as anti-inflammatory and muscle relaxant medications, conservative management with physical therapy or chiropractic, epidural injections, uh, percutaneous discectomy, which is relevant to this case. Or if all of those methods fail, we can talk about referring the patient to a spine surgeon for a spinal fusion or a laminectomy, which is an option of last resort. For patients that have failed all of those methods or have no other option, spinal cord stimulation is another option of last resort. So based on that explanation, the first thing you, once you recognize it's a herniation, uh, it isn't to perform a disectomy. Well, it depends. That is one potential option that could exist. Um, you, you don't necessarily you have to. Stop for a sec. I'm going to object to this line of questioning. Uh, may we approach? Yep. Okay. All right, Mr. Huntley, you may continue. So I think we left off and you were telling the jury about um, the different ways you treat a herniation. And you first start off with, and I'll let you pick back up. 
generally when we first initially evaluate a patient, they haven't had imaging studies or uh, sometimes they do uh, have prior MRIs. So uh, it really just depends on what kind of prior treatment has already been attempted. If no prior treatment has been attempted, usually we'll start with some sort of conservative method of medications and either physical therapy or chiropractic while we're ordering MRIs and going over the MRI results with the patient. If conservative management has been effective, then patients will no longer be complaining of pain. But if they're continuing to complain of moderate to severe pain, uh, meaning on a scale of zero to 10, at least a four out of 10 or greater, then we can talk about more advanced strategies to treat their pain, which could consist of epidural injections or percutaneous discectomy or nerve blocks or nerve ablations generally. So it really depends on the kind of pain that they're having, what their MRI findings show. And uh, part of it is also up to the patient about what strategy to use. Some patients want to avoid epidural injections because of the steroids and the side effects involved of epidural steroids. Epidural injections have never actually been approved by the FDA for steroids in the epidural space. Uh, and there can be side effects with epidural injections, which typically provide short-term relief and not have never really been proven to provide long-term relief. That's one reason why percutaneous discectomy is a great option for longer-term relief. It's been quoted by the manufacturer to have a 90% success rate. Ten-year studies have shown that it's effective even at the point of 10 years in 65 to 76% of patients. So that's a pretty good option for patients that want to avoid surgery and want a longer term solution than just epidural injections. So then if I heard you correctly, if injections don't work, then you elevate to the percutaneous discectomy as a, another treatment option. Well, you don't necessarily have to go in that order. You could go straight to percutaneous discectomy if desired. It's really uh, a joint decision process between the physician and the patient and discussing the risks, benefits, indications, and alternatives of both procedures. Some patients, when they have both options, want to try epidural injections first. Others want to try the discectomy first, and there's, uh, it's reasonable to uh, uh, go to either route to initially try uh, management. And if epidural injections don't help, then we can always reserve the discectomy for later usage, or we can go straight to the percutaneous discectomy if that's the patient's desire. And uh, do you know if all pain specialists such as yourself provide this service or? In Georgia, it's not very common. I was lucky to be trained on this procedure in my residency in Illinois. Um, and for whatever reason, geographically, there are variations across the country in training programs. In Georgia, there's really only Emory University and Medical College of Georgia at Augusta for pain medicine training programs. And to my knowledge, I don't believe that they teach the procedure at either of those training programs. Uh, so I think because of that, there are fewer physicians in Georgia offering this procedure because they simply are not skilled or adept in offering it as a treatment option. Because I'm very comfortable offering it and I've had excellent success, and based on my education, training, and experience, uh, I think it's my obligation to at least offer that option when it's appropriate. Now that we've talked about the percutaneous discectomy. Can you explain exactly what that procedure is to the jury? So we brought up the earlier analogy of a jelly donut with the two treatment options that we just mentioned in terms of epidural injections and discectomies. The epidural injection is like- Stop for a sec. Okay. okay. Is this better with the, is the microphone or? Yeah, the microphone's on. Unfortunately, you gotta get kind of close to it. Sure. Pick it. So between the two treatment options, the epidural injection is similar to putting a glaze around that jelly donut that's leaking. So it's putting in medication around that disc herniation to reduce the inflammation and reduce the irritation of the nerve. The discectomy is a procedure where we're placing a needle into the disc herniation and removing part of the disc material. And what that does is it creates a negative pressure vacuum inside the disc so if you have part of it that is protruding, you can then create a negative pressure vacuum to help suck it back into place. So it helps treat the underlying cause rather than simply putting medicine around the problem. Um, and uh, that is what leads to the pain relief with that procedure. And so you say pain relief. Typically with these type of injuries, what type of pain do you see from patients that you treat? 
Well, it's variable. If you have a disc herniation, you may not necessarily have painful symptoms. So we only reserve these types of treatment options for when we expect that the benefits would outweigh the risks. We don't offer these types of interventions for patients that have mild pain. So if your pain is a zero or a one or a two or a three, we wouldn't recommend it. Even if you were scheduled for the procedure and you show up on the day of the procedure and your pain is improved, we would not proceed with it unless there was medical necessity, meaning that you had moderate to severe pain rated at least four out of 10. Um, we have most of that documented uh, in our medical records, along with how the pain is affecting a particular patient, whether it's interfering with sitting, standing, walking, or other types of daily activities. Now, you mentioned risk. Are, what are the risks associated with this type of treatment? Any procedure contains risk. Uh, the main risks with any type of needle procedure are infection or bleeding. We do everything under sterile conditions in an operating room at a uh, uh, surgical facility. And we make sure that we provide preoperative antibiotics so that we can reduce the risk of infection. Um, there's also risks of anesthesia that can involve uh, organ damage or even death with the anesthesia. Uh, with the procedures that we do, because we're operating in the spine, there can be risks of nerve damage. There can be risks of paralysis. And uh, those are rare risks, but they can be extraordinarily serious when they occur. So any patient that undergoes this treatment has to, they're read these risks before they undergo? Yes, there's an informed consent sheet that outlines the major classes of risks. So let's talk about the procedure itself. How long does it take and what does it involve? So uh, which procedure are we referring to? And I'm talking about the percutaneous dissectomy. So initially we have to prepare the patient for the surgical procedure. Um, so there's uh, nursing involved in terms of getting the patient ready, placing an IV. Uh, there's a nurse anesthetist. Typically the procedure can be done awake, but most patients want anesthesia sedation for this. Uh, and then the patient's brought into the operating room. They're positioned on the operating table. Uh, they, uh, we have to prepare their skin with an antiseptic solution. We have to drape them with sterile drapes. Uh, and then uh, at that point, we make sure that they've been given preoperative antibiotics. We do a safety checklist called a timeout. Then we start lining up the uh, x-ray machine because these procedures are done under fluoroscopic guidance, which means there's a real-time x-ray to guide where the needle is placed so I know where to place it. And uh, we have to spend time to provide the accurate location and trajectory to place the needle. And at that point, once the patient is anesthetized with sedation uh, and local anesthesia, we then place the needle into the disc. So under real-time guidance, we have to uh, incrementally uh, make sure that we're placing the needle in the correct place. So we have to move the needle, then take another image, move the needle, take an image, move the needle, take an image, and make sure throughout the entire process that we're placing it in the safe location that it needs to go. Um, I brought one of the needles with me. I, I I haven't opened it up yet, and uh, if you don't need me to open up, I, I won't, but it's six inches long, um, so it is a sizable needle about that long, and it has to be placed under x-ray guidance to the particular spot uh, with very little uh, tolerance for error. Once that needle is inside the disc, and we use multiple views of the x-ray machine, so we have a view from um, uh, head-on, then also from an angle, then from the side, so we can make sure we get a three-dimensional uh, uh, accurate location of where the needle tip is. Then uh, in this instance, I believe there are multiple levels performed. So we have to place multiple needles into each one of those discs. Then once the needles are in position, there's another device that goes through this needle and that has uh, basically an Archimedes screw at the end. And what that does is uh, it's uh, a device kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, kind of like a rotor router, I guess is the best layman's analogy I can use where it spins and removes part of the material inside the disc because that's placed through the needle. So the needle is really just a conduit to place the second device through, and that allows us to remove the disc material. Uh, the manufacturer recommends that this is performed for about three to 10 minutes per level, no longer than 10 minutes is the maximum per level of operation of the device. So um, if you have multiple levels, that accordingly increases the time. Now, and if the court will allow, can I publish this news? 
Tell me what you mean by published to the jury. I'd like to allow the jury to see, you know, the length of the meal and what is used in a return use of the safety in order to. Okay. I mean, you're going to, do you want the doc? Okay. You just want to hold it up? Okay. I think they saw it, but you can hold it up. Sure. We're not going to pass it around. No passing around of exhibits now. Okay. You can hold it. They can see it. So you saw this. Okay. And this is the needle that you use. Do you have to use an individual needle for each you go to different discs each time? That's how I do it. You could use one needle, finish the procedure, then move the other needle, you know, move the needle around. But I find it much more efficient to place all of the needles uh, and then start placing the second device through it one at a time. Yeah. And, and Your Honor, I'd like to move the needle that's around the evidence and Okay. Are you comfortable never seeing that needle again? That's fine with me. Okay. Any objection to what number is this going to be? This would be number 11. Okay. Any objection to plaintiff's 11? No objection. Plaintiff's 11, the six inch needle is admitted. Now, you talked about this procedure, the percutaneous disectomy. Typically, how long does this procedure last? So as I mentioned, it takes uh, time to line up the x-ray machine. It takes time to place the needle. And then after that, usually you have three to 10 minutes of actual activation time of the device per level. So it depends on how many levels you're doing, but it would be uh, you know, somewhere between three to 10 minutes per level. And the patients, are they able to just walk in, have this procedure and walk out? If you do it under local anesthetic, which is rare, but it does occur, you can have that done awake. And I've had patients who drive home afterwards. Most patients elect to have this done under conscious sedation uh, with anesthesia. Um, so they're asleep for the procedure. Uh, and this, in most instances, we use propofol, which is a medication similar to what people may get during a colonoscopy or was made famous during the Michael Jackson trial. Uh, but that's something that puts you to sleep and keeps you asleep during the procedure. All right. So let's move to uh, this particular case. Did you have an opportunity to treat uh, Mr. Chia? Yes. And do you re recall when you first began treating Mr. Chia? I don't have any independent recollection, so I'd have to uh, refer to the relevant treatment notes. All right. So I am going to show you what has been previously marked as plaintiff's exhibit three. All right, and this is a medical record for Mr. Chia and it came from your business and you work at Comprehensive Spine, is that correct? Correct. And I'm going to go to oh, I think that was Nine, nine. So was this the first time that you encountered Mr. Chia? Uh, I believe that this was the initial evaluation by my nurse practitioner. So I did not personally evaluate him on this day, but this was the first evaluation under my supervision at my practice. And did you have an opportunity to review the records from? Yes. And what did those records indicate to you? Uh, from what I can see, we may have to scroll down, but initially his pain scale is an eight out of 10. So he can uh, considered his pain severe. He was complaining of neck pain that was radiating down both arms and back pain radiating down both legs. Um, he did describe that this was affecting various aspects of his daily life, uh, which I think are detailed further higher up. That we. Oh, just I'm sorry. Passed. Tell me when to stop. And I was scrolling down. Tell me when you want me to stop. Uh, right here is good. So it looks like he described that this was impairing 
his ability with driving, walking, lifting, sitting, standing, and walking. Um, we did have a prior MRI that showed some disc herniations in his low back at L2-3, L3-4, and L4-5. Um, you can scroll down. <coughs> this way? Yes. He did state that he had headaches. You can continue. Can you just tell me when to stop? Your Honor. Okay. Hold on one second. Mr. Williams? Move this off the screen. Your Honor. Take something off the screen? Yes. Take off the screen now. Yes. Whatever it is, stop sharing your screen. All right, let's not scroll past any problematic text. We've had long discussions about. Absolutely. I was just letting the doctor go to where I didn't know in the record. Let me do this. Work. You know, let me go. Let me do it a different way. I'll go to the hard copy, and then the doctor can direct me to the page he'd like me to do. Okay. Sir. That'd be great. So these are the same records. Faster. Okay, so continue on. So I believe that the next visit was on September 16th, 2020. And if you tell me the page number, I will go here so the jury can be in the same place as you are. Mm -hmm. On this, let's see. Tell me what page number. Page 14, I think. Okay. That was 925. I think this was the second visit. Okay, yeah. It must have been moved from the 16th to the 25th then. It looks like the pain scale at this date was... Um, a six out of 10. And then if we go down to the bottom of page 15. Well, we can stop here first. It shows that the MRI dated September 20th shows that there were disc herniations 
at C3, 4, C4, 5, and C7, T1, as well as disc herniations at L3, 4, and L4, 5. And what does that mean? Can you explain what that means? You understand it, but none of us do. Sure. So there are seven neck bones in the cervical spine. There's five in the lumbar spine. And what this means is that the MRI, which basically spins your protons in your body so that fluid shows white, it gives you an idea of where it allows us to look at soft tissue, whereas x-rays and CT scans allow us to only look at bones. So MRIs are really the best imaging modality to look at discs, which are soft tissue, and to look at whether those discs are herniated, and it allows us to look at the nerves and how close the discs are to the nerves. So some of these abbreviations here, HNP means herniated nucleus pulposus, which basically means herniated disc. The nucleus is that center jelly that we were talking about before. SCS is an abbreviation that we're using for spinal canal stenosis. So his uh, canal or basically the area for his nerves to pass is being narrowed to eight millimeters at C3-4 to seven millimeters at C4-5. Uh, and he also has uh, NFS, which stands for neuroforaminal stenosis, which basically means that the window through which the nerve exits is also being crowded. Um, so the findings allow us to get an accurate map of what's abnormal in his spine, and it shows us where those disc herniations are. So based on your review of this, you understood that there were disc herniations with Mr. Chia? Yes. Was this the only MRI that you reviewed? There was a prior MRI dated May 29th, 2020 that was also reviewed. And do you recall that MRI? That shows that there were disc herniations at L2-3, L3-4, and L4-5. Were those herniations the same as you saw in this MRI, or were they something different? The L3-4 and L4-5 herniations were still present. Uh, it looks like the L2-3 herniation had resolved. Meaning a herniation that you could discern from the May MRI was gone by the time of this August-September MRI. Correct. Um, now, from this and reviewing both of the MRIs, what did you recommend? Uh, again, this evaluation was with my nurse practitioner. If we go down to the page 17, at that point, her recommendations for proceeding with percutaneous discectomy were documented or percutaneous disc decompression. Those are similar terms for the same procedure. These are abbreviated as PDD in the record. So if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, uh, she indicates that she Mr. sent Yana, him some education. Stop for a second. Take, a, take, Yana, take Yana, down whatever's on the screen. Yana, I need to take a bow. Issue outside the presence of the jury. All right, it's a good time for a break anyway. Um, ladies and gentlemen, to the jury room for a few minutes. I got to talk with the lawyers um, and we'll get you back in here as soon as we can. Don't talk about the case. Enjoy. Um, I meant to mention, um, you're welcome to be out in the hallway as well, as long as you're not making a ruckus. Um, two more judges there, to the nice judges. Um, you know, you can, if you want to be on your phone, something where you're not talking too loud, feel free to be in that um, hallway as well, just in case it gets a little crowded in the jury room. Let's take them back. Thank you. Uh oh. You okay? You sure? All right, they're two steps down. Fortunately, there was a doctor right there at his pain management. He was reaching for that six inch needle. Yeah, he was reaching for it. Yikes. This is not a all right, doctor, if you don't mind stepping outside, we'll get you back in here as soon as we can. You can leave your 8,000 car keys here if you want and uh, take them with you. All right.
Mr. Williams. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, this you is, all can be seated. I'm standing just because I've been sitting all day. Yes, Your Honor. This is the second time in the last 15 minutes that Plans Council has flashed on the screen the problematic uh, wording in the records, which Dr. Paulo uh, diagnoses and medically relates the uh, injuries he's talking about to the May 2020 accident. That goes directly against your previous ruling in the case, Your Honor. Uh, you know which page? I, it's not that many pages. The the discovery, this exhibit, is not all that long. If you know which pages have the problematic language, we will not go to those pages. Period. It's, it's, it's repeated, but it may be throughout. It is repeated throughout, and Plans Council keeps scrolling up, um, showing that the herniation to a reasonable degree of medical certainty is related. Uh, the lumbar reticulopathy to a reasonable degree of, of medical certainty is related. Um, Your Honor, this is exactly the issue that we had prior to trial that we objected to, uh, that the court has ruled on, that limited the testimony, and just to flash it on the screen now twice in less than 15 minutes, Your Honor, this is unacceptable. I'm objecting. I think that there needs to be a curative instruction to the jury. And frankly, Your Honor, I never asked, but I'm going to ask for admonishment uh, of opposing counsel in front of the jury. I mean, this is ridiculous. Okay. This is the whole issue, Your Honor. Certainly. As your honor can see, there was no intent to publish anything. I am being directed by the doctor and I have every question that I'm asking him, I am making sure that we're not getting into that causation issue. As you can hear, I'm asking about the treatment of the injuries. I've never once alluded to or stated that this is the cause. There was no intent and I, to be quite honest, I didn't see any of that document where it said, you know, I know that, I know it says that, but I didn't see where we were flashing it, where it said that, of course, defense counsel was staring with a fine tooth comb, so I'm pretty sure it did say it, but there was no intent, and I am really skirting around it, and there's no intent to try to uh, skirt or to avoid what we've already discussed. Well, Your Honor, I mean, we went to the paper document, he went right back to showing the document on the screen, Your Honor, so I can, I can only assume that there's intent. I mean, this is ridiculous okay so so i don't i don't find intent i think it was inadvertent i think that um so far mr huntley you get a high grade for keeping your questions away from causation you get a medium grade from handling the digital exhibit but there's an easy fix we are no longer publishing um plaintiffs three those will not be on screens you are free to ask the good doctor questions you can have it on your screen so you can see what he's looking at, but don't share your screen. As long as you, do you have a hard copy of, okay, or, or you have on your, okay. both of you have on your machines. Okay. So so my instruction is from here on out with Dr. Paula, um, he's got the exhibit in front of him. So he'll go through, hey, let's look at page X. The three lawyers can all see page X on their screens. We will not see page X on the screen. I think just the way you've got it scanned in where you have to scroll rather than jump from page to page, no problem. We're just not going to have it on the big screen. So um, he can read what it says, as in read out loud, or you can use it to refresh his recollection, which is really what you're trying to do. Hey, what, what was going on here? Um, and if in the end, so we avoid an objection, what the doctor is doing is reading from the document rather than saying I'm refreshed. They're his documents. He can read from them in the same way you could, absent this little series of landmines we've got out there, you could slap the page up there, highlight it, just like Mr. Williams very effectively did with your client. But we're not going to do that because I don't want to run that risk anymore. I find, so the record is clear, that this was inadvertent. It was in passing. No attention was drawn to it other than you objecting, but you didn't explain to the jury why you were objecting. So I don't think you've drawn attention to it. I'll also observe for the record, these pages, it's small print, the pages are flying by, and it's mostly large, complicated words. So I think the risk of actual prejudice is very small, but I don't want it to happen again. And the way we can ensure that is that we're not publishing Plaintiffs 3 anymore. Um, you're free to use Plaintiffs 3 in the way you were, just don't publish it. He's got the hard copy, you all have a digital copy. And we'll manage it that way. One other thing, and then I'll take responses um, to what we said. We had a sidebar um, earlier. Um, Mr. Williams expressed concern that Mr. Huntley 
in asking Dr. Pupala about what I'll call the ladder of treatment from least invasive to most invasive was somehow preparing to, I think he used the word back door or circle around to get into causation. I disagreed with Mr. Williams and said, I thought this was basically building the um, groundwork for having the doctor to do what he did, which is describe what this disectomy is. I didn't realize we we're gonna all get to look at the needle, which was fine. Um, and so I indicated I didn't see an issue with what Mr. Huntley had been doing. Um, I wanna give Mr. Williams a chance to add more to the record if he thinks I haven't adequately described his concern, but I felt that there wasn't anything that I needed to do based on where we were at that time, especially given Mr. Huntley's reaffirmation that he understood the ruling, he might not agree with it, but he wasn't trying to backdoor any causation testimony. And I'm repeating myself now, I don't think the flipping through the document digitally was an effort to backdoor either, um, but I don't disagree with Mr. Williams that there may have been on the screen um, for a bit language to the effect of what um, Mr. Williams said, but I think we fixed that problem. So I just said a lot. I want to start with you, Mr. Williams. Is there anything you want to add to perfect the concern you raised during our sidebar? Uh, no, Your Honor, I think you were uh, accurate and succinct in your recitation. I'll just maintain my objection, my standing objection to this witness testifying, which we handled prior to the beginning of evidence. Uh, and I'll reiterate that, you know, uh, for the record, uh, twice I've had to get up and make a scene because of the records being flashed on, on the screen with, uh, containing the opinions of the doctor as relatedness of these injuries to the accident. And that is absolutely against the court's orders. Okay. And, and quite frankly, I'm having to draw attention to it by objecting. Understood, and uh, I think this solution will prevent you from having to do that again. We would be limited to, um, there is either a question that would clearly um, elicit a response about causation or the doctor slides in that direction, but it was good to hear um, Mr. Huntley tell us on the record, he has told Dr. Pupala, I'm not taking you there, don't get yourself there to, to causation. Mr. Huntley, anything you want to add to our conversation on the record? No, that's absolutely correct. And I'm in agreement with the court if that's going to pre prevent that from happening because it makes my job easier and I don't have to worry about it. am I showing something or not showing anything. So I have nothing further. Great. All right. Um, then um, are you guys good or do you need a three minute break? Three minute break, John. All right. Do it. I'll be back out in a few minutes and we'll see if the jurors are ready to come back out. Your Honor, you think we'll get to closing today or what is the plan? No, not given what time it is. So I'd love to finish with the doctor so he doesn't need to come back, okay. um, but he needs to be available for cross-examination. So if, if you aren't gonna be done soon, you're gonna need to make him available tomorrow um, because the defense needs a chance to chat with him. Oh, here it is. Yeah, see. 
This is the message the pathway, right? Yeah. So let's see. This is page 15. Page and now this is copy. Hold on. Page, you can see, page 20 to 14. I mean, I don't know because I think it just cuts off there. You see, but hey, it's odd. Let's see. Let's scroll up. Fourteen. Uh, attention. Blah, blah, blah. This thing should be, you know. Uh, it's it's Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna waste that time with that. Okay. We got bigger problems. I'm going to rent to the restroom before it comes back.
I reorganize them right away. If I do them by most consecutive star. Oh. So. Four tons of water for each day. Any idea where your lawyer went, Mr. Chia? Uh, he's gone to the uh, restaurant. Okay. Oh, he's right there. Ready for the jury? I am ready. Do you want to bring Please. Mr. Williams, ready for the jury? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Great. You can read back my final question because I have no idea what it was. It was, I have only one more question for you, Dr. Pupawa. <laughs> Well, 13, one empty seat. And so um, someone didn't file all the way down, I'm like, oh, you're leaving that one empty seat, but then they just were full there. So 13, you were like, why? I can't get to 14. No, 13, one, three. That's right. And then you were scrolling through and red alert. Okay. All right. If the jurors are ready, let's bring them in, please. Thank you, sir. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We still have Dr. Pupala on the stand, and Mr. Huntley's going to continue with his direct exam. All right. And Dr. Pupala, I think my last question was you reviewed the MRI from May, or roughly around May of 2020, and then another one later in the year. Is that correct? Correct. And after reviewing those MRIs, what did you recognize those injuries to be have suffered by Mr. Chia? Uh, there were disc herniations on both MRIs at L3-4 and L4-5. And after seeing both of those herniations, they, let me, I'm sorry, let me start here. They appeared on both the MRI earlier in the year and the one later in the year. Correct. Okay. After reviewing those MRIs, what was your recommendation? Uh, the recommendation that was made by my nurse practitioner was to proceed with percutaneous discectomy procedures uh, in both the neck and the low back. And those were scheduled, I believe, for October 1st. And those procedures are what you've already described to us with the big old needle and the Archimedes screw and negative pressure? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, and I, I think it might've been scheduled for October the 1st, but it did not occur until October the 26th. If you will go to page six of plaintiff's exhibit three, I think that'll help your recollection. 
Yes, and the procedure note itself is on page nine. So that's where I'm directing my attention. Okay, now tell us about the procedure. What did you do? So it looks like we started with doing his neck procedure. And in that instance, we have the patient positioned on their back with their neck up and their neck turned. So we're actually entering from the front of the neck uh, on either of the sides. So we did this at C3-4 and C7-T1. It looks like we were unable to place the needle into the disc space at C4-5. Uh, and I'm just going to slow you down a little bit. What does that mean? You, what did you do? So uh, we had the patient, uh, you know, their skin is prepped with antiseptic solution. Their surgical drapes are placed. And then under x-ray guidance, the needle, that six inch needle that I showed you before is placed into the front of the neck, into the disc space, taking uh, care to avoid any of the major blood vessels <laughs> and other vital structures. Like the aorta. Aorta's in the chest. So Whatever. Yeah, one of those carotid. big ones in the <laughs> neck. You know what I mean, Doc. The carotid is the main one. Carotid. Yeah, dodge that one. So after performing this, you were saying you were unable to do some portion of the surgery. Is one of the levels at C4-5, we could not place the needle into the disc space. And why was that? Uh, I don't have additional details in our note. If I had the images in front of me, that would give me additional information. But um, it's rare, but occasionally we just simply can't advance the needle to where it needs to go. Okay. So continue on with the procedure. What else did you perform? Uh, so once that, once those needles were placed into the neck, we had two of them at the C3-4 area, which is towards the top of the neck and C7-T1, which is towards the bottom of the neck, uh, closer to the subclavian artery, which would be a branch of the aorta. Uh, uh, once those needles are in place, then we place that other device with the screw that spins and that would remove the disc material from those areas in the neck. And then uh, we then flip the patient over onto his stomach to perform the lumbar procedure at L3-4 and L4-5. Now, I know you mentioned early in your testimony, before you perform this type of procedure on, on any patient, they have to have a certain pain level threshold. Do you recall what his pain level was on that day? Six out of 10. And did, was that cause to continue with the procedure? Correct. So you, you did the percutaneous disectomy on his neck and you did it on his back. Um, did you do anything else? That's all that was done on that day. Okay. After you completed um, the procedure on Mr. Chia, was he afforded any relief? Pain relief. I don't believe I saw a follow-up appointment afterwards. There may have been a follow-up phone call because when I was preparing for this uh, testimony today, I did see in his medical records at some point that 100% uh, relief, I believe for eight weeks was documented uh, at, at some point in the medical chart. I don't know when that was documented. I don't know how sustained his relief was. Okay. So even though you get relief right after, it can fluctuate as to how much you get and how long it lasts. Correct. And that's typically why we schedule a follow-up appointment, uh, which I believe was initially scheduled, um, or he had another appointment scheduled for November 6, 2020, uh, to see if he had persistent pain, would a second procedure of a different nature be recommended. And you, there was a second procedure you indicated in your notes. I think it was a hydro incision. Is that correct? Hydro incision. So that is a procedure <coughs> where needles are placed into the disc herniation and then a wire is placed through that needle over that guide wire. A tube is advanced into the disc. So the tube is now the conduit to perform a procedure through. It's a larger procedure. It involves a small skin incision. Um, and through that tube, there's a device called a spine jet, which has a hook on it. And it has uh, basically a high pressure nozzle that saline is injected at a high rate and high pressure with a vacuum. So it's kind of like pressure washing the inside of the disc. And I can reserve that option for patients that are still in pain after the percutaneous discectomy that was performed. Uh, in this instance, it wasn't performed. 
And from what I mentioned about how 100% relief for eight weeks was documented at some point, it appears that that procedure wouldn't have been indicated if he was feeling better based on the limited knowledge that I am aware of. Uh, and again, I don't know how long he had pain relief and to what extent necessarily with 100% accuracy as I sit here today, but on best information and belief, he did have uh, at least two months of relief from the procedure that we did and perhaps longer. Okay. So if he needed treatment in the future, would you have to perform another MRI to see where he was, or would you just go right into the hydro incision? Uh, it depends. Uh, at this point, it's been two years later. It would be reasonable to uh, reorder new MRIs if desired, but you could also use the prior MRIs to guide treatment and uh, yeah, some I'm options. I'm object, Stop for a second. I want to object to both question and response on that. As what was the last part? You're objecting why? Uh, future treatment and uh, the witness's response. Okay. So what's the relevance of what we could do if it hasn't been done yet? Because I think we heard the testimony from Mr. Chia that he was still encountering some pain. And we're just talking about what treatment options would be available to Mr. Chia if he so desired to have something else or the pain doesn't resolve. So it's just laying the foundation of what future treatment might entail for Mr. Chia. But what's the relevance of, of future treatment? It's speculative. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, maybe. He, so I, I'm not sure that's relevant to what we're working through here. And I, and I would go to say that the future treatment has based on him currently being in pain to this day and possibly seeking medical attention for that pain that he's incurring. So it's not speculative if he goes and treats the pain that he's currently in. It wouldn't if he testified. And next week, I'm going to see Dr. Pupala for this pressure washing of the inside of my discs. But I don't recall his testimony to that effect. You are correct. All right. Next question. All right. So moving on past that, um, that was the last time you spoke with Mr. Chee. Is that correct? Yes. I don't have any further questions. All right. Mr. Williams, Mr. Ham. Hello, Doctor. Hello. Please bear with me just a second. And everyone, we're I'm new to the technology in the courtroom, a very paper. Worry and so I apologize for some little clutter. Uh, Dr. Paula, uh, the facility where the treatment happened for Mr. Chia, that's comprehensive spine and pain, is that right? Correct. Uh, you own that facility, isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. And doctor, I think you testified earlier on direct that your focus is on treating pain in your patients. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So, doctor, if yeah, I think you also testified that with respect to the disectomy, I'm hopefully saying that correctly. I'm probably not. So, I apologize. But with respect to that, you would not perform that procedure if your patients came in complaining of zero, one, two, or three on a pain scale. Is that correct? That's an accurate statement. All right. So that's essentially mild pain, is that correct? Correct, on the day of that evaluation. Pain symptoms can wax and wane, but uh, if a patient presents for a procedure and their pain is not, uh, at least a four out of 10, our general practice is to cancel the procedure that day for that reason, and uh, we maintain a log of that. Now, Doctor, you're aware of the accident that we hear about today, the May 2020 accident, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you're aware that Mr. Chia was involved in the subsequent accident, August 2020. You're aware of that as well? Uh, in general terms, yes. Okay. All right. Are you aware that Mr. Chia reported to his treating provider after the May accident during his last visit that his pain level was at his neck a one? No. Were you aware that Mr. Chia reported to his uh, treatment provider after the May accident during his last visit that his low back pain was a two? No. You would agree with me, doctor, that the pain levels, like I said, to wax and wane, but 
Mr. Chia was reporting one and two levels of pain during his last visit. He was on his way to healing at that point. Do you have those records available for me to review? Sure. Joe, when was previously marked as defendant's to the C, this is the last bit of treatment she did at pain. Okay, proceed. Yeah. Do you recall my last question? No, sorry. My last question to you was that it makes sense. That sounds like Mr. Chia was on his way to healing after the May 2020 accident before he, the August 2020 accident when he came to see you. Is that correct? Uh, all I can really comment on this note is that it, it does appear that his pain was mild in intensity at the time of this evaluation. But in terms of responding to my question, you, can you say or cannot say whether or not Mr. Hill appeared to be on his way to Keeley following the May 20th after you've now reviewed his record, Mike? Sure. It's with an isolated snapshot. I can't really make a conclusion one way or another. Okay. Fair enough. Well, doctor, are you own comprehensive, uh, sorry, let me get this right, comprehensive spine and pain. Um, that is your practice, right? I think you established that a little bit earlier. Uh, so the records from Mr. Chia, if I had requested records from Mr. Chia and plans council requested records from Mr. Chia for treatment for your practice, they should be the same, shouldn't they? There's a custodian of records that handles the records requests. I understand that, but it's your practice. You own it. The records should be the same. If I ordered the same records that plans were ordered. I would expect that the records would be identical for the time of any given record request. Okay, great. Then I want you to take a look at something for me. I'm going to share with you Plants Exhibit number three. There, I think there should be a copy up there. Hey, hey, Your Honor, I thought we weren't publishing. I haven't published anything. He's about to. So um, it's good that he asked, given the discussions we've had. Sure. Plaintiff's Exhibit three probably shouldn't be going up on the screen, but um, Dr. Pupala has a copy of it right there. And so correct. let's stick with paper, if that's okay, that's in case there's a... Um, Redirect based on your questions about exhibit three. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is it number three, doctor? Yes. All what right. page? Uh, well, let's go to the first page, actually. Very first page, certification at the top. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the certification which you were talking about earlier, correct? From your medical, uh, medical records facility, correct? Yes, and it looks like this was furnished on June 17th, 2022. So a few days ago. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. If you will go to we'll use page number seven here under problems. Are you there? Yes. All right. You've got injury of neck, injury of low back pain, onset May 2020. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. I will turn your attention to plans exhibit number nine. The records are keeping progressive. You have that, sir? Yes. All right. And at the top there, first page, there's a certification as well? Yes. And that's dated May 18th, 2022? Yes. Right? Okay. So that would have been full month before uh, 
plants exhibit number three. Isn't that correct? Yes, I would state that this certification is not from my practice, though. I understand, but someone at your practice obviously signed. Well, no, you practiced it. Someone at your practice did not sign that certification. I'm just saying that it's dated May 18, 2022, correct? The correct. certification is yes. dated then? You're talking real fast. Right? Yes. Sure. The certification is dated May 18, 2022. This is for Progressive. Correct. And I want to add that the certification we were referencing earlier was a certification of medical records. This looks like a certification and declaration for production of documents to a non-party. Um, so I'm just, I'm not an attorney, but I'm just stating that these look like different types of documents to me. They are, in fact, the same document. I know the, the language is a little bit different, but for all participants' purposes, their certifications that the records are what they say they are. But moving on to plaintiff's exhibit number nine, if you go to page four, excuse me, page five, you got review problems. Mr. Chi again, right? Correct. All right. And there it says the onset is August 20th, 2020, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, and neck pain due to previous motor vehicle accident, May 2020, exacerbated recently by the August 26, 2020 accident. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So, doctor, help me understand. The records I got from Progressive a full month before, which had your records in there, have different dates when the onset of the injury occurred from the records that was just introduced. A plans council. Can so, you put them side by, I don't mean physically side by side, but like which page from three sure. and which page from nine so page, should Dr. Bupala be looking at? Sure, it's page five from exhibit number nine and page, let me get back to it, Your Honor. Seven of plans exhibit number three. And I can put, actually put this on the screen. I think this was, this doesn't have the language issue. Okay. But he may also have it right in front of him. Sure. Either way, he just, I want him to have them side by side. So mm -hmm. he's not trying to guess what's in one versus the other. Mm -hmm. So I do have these side by side. I don't have an explanation for the difference. Okay. Now, doctor, you've got an interest in the outcome of this case, don't you? I actually don't know. I'm not sure if we have an existing financial interest in this case. Don't know. Okay. Well, let me see if I can refresh your recollection here. Also, doctor, this is not the case in March. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> We're going to call this the Phoenix Exhibit E. You already have one as oh. E. You may not have admitted it, but your list, it's American Health Imaging Exhibit E. Should we call this F? We shall. All right. I'm ready to answer questions about it. All right. So you have a financial interest in the outcome of this case, don't you, doctor? I believe my prior statement is I don't know if we have an existing relation, uh, existing interest at this time. Uh, it's possible that this assignment of proceeds could have been reassigned to another third party. Um, essentially where the accounts receivable would have been already sold to another company. I, I simply just don't know at this time whether that has occurred or not. Uh, and it looks like this treatment was back in 2020, um, so over 18 months ago. And it's possible that uh, generally after 18 months of outstanding accounts receivable, we sometimes do reassign that kind of financial interest. In this instance, I don't know whether that's occurred or not. Okay, but at one point you had a financial interest. Is that fair to say? Yes. And you still might have financial interest. You just don't know. 
Correct. Because you haven't looked at your books. Correct. Okay. So it's certainly possible. Yes. Okay. Speaking of financial interest, doctor, isn't it true that you offer 80% discount to pay to your patients to pay up front? There's a, pre, there's a prepayment discount provided if uh, payment is rendered prior to the provision of services. Right. So 80% of the listed charge off, correct? If it's provided prior to the service, correct? Correct. What I'm saying is correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So your practice, if they charged Mr. Chia $227,624.20, and Mr. Chia paid up front, he would have got an 80% discount. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And it's your business, correct? Yes. All right. And you've decided that 20% of the list of charge is sufficient as a reasonable value for your services. Uh, I believe that that rate for the prepayment discount was provided based on an average of third-party collections agencies. And if you go to collections, what's your typical uh, success rate of actually getting payment from a collections agency? Right. Appreciate that, doctor. Not my question. Question was, you've elected that 20% of the list of charge is a reasonable rate for your services. Isn't that correct? That would be the rate if we had prepayment for services, correct? If every patient you had for a year prepaid, could you stay in business? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. What do you think would happen? I, I would simply have to look into that more. I, I, I can't really answer that without looking into our overhead and procedural volume. And doctor, you're not here today out of the goodness of your heart. Is that correct? Uh, could you clarify your question? Sure. How much are you being paid to be here today to testify? Uh, our standard rate is $2,500 an hour outside of clinical hours and $5,000 an hour during clinical hours. We were able to move our schedule around, so we are able to honor the lower rates of $2,500 per hour. Okay. And how much I, you I have a question. When you say R, meaning you, you have other doctors in your practice, or if a records custodian came in to testify about records, would that be $2,500 an hour also? That would be for me as a physician. So the R is you? Correct. Okay. Right. Well, doctor, you're on the clock. How much are you up to? Uh, it looks like I've been here for an hour and 15, say 18 minutes. Does that include your travel as well? Uh, this is on my way home. So this is exclusive of travel. Right. So knocking off a discount because you're on your way home, right? Well, there's no need for additional travel beyond. Uh, I got you. So, all right. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Huntley, any redirect for Dr. Papali? Absolutely. But before I start, I don't know if we want to address this outside of the jury because I don't. We've had a long discussion and we're almost at the end. But defense counsel brought up a big point caused by. And he goes into a lot of things about causation. Objection, Yara. Can we take this up outside of the jury? Yeah, we'll need to do that. Um, but uh, I would love to finish with Dr. Papala today so he doesn't need to come back. Um, so um, we're going to have a brief conversation. Um, I'm going to have you stay right here because if I have you go into the jury room, just natural, you're going to disperse and we'll get you back here. Um, can you, how long do you think your redirect will be? Put that in terms of minutes, not Adjectives. 15 minutes? Okay, we'll hold you to that. Um, are, is anyone not able to stay to about 5.15 today? You can stay till 6? I know, but what's the difference between 10 minutes from now and 20 minutes from now? Okay. Um, uh, you all stay right where you are. Let's go outside and talk briefly. You, doctor, stay right there too, please.
five. <laughs> you gotta press that little black button. Thanks. All right, Mr. Huntley, your redirect. Okay, and I'm gonna make this quick. So doctor, you, you talked about um, the pain levels and, and they can fluctuate. So if you're a one today, does that mean you'll be a one tomorrow? Not necessarily. So when you saw Mr. Chia, where was his pain level? I believe uh, we established that his pain scores were between a six and an eight on his initial evaluations and up to his procedure. Okay. And also you looked at that ACA record and it reflected that, you know, Mr. Chia still was in pain. Did that record reflect that all his pain had resolved when he ended treatment? No, I don't believe so. So when he ended treatment, he was still in pain when he finished with ACA pursuant to that record. Yes. Now, you, you talked briefly about um, some records being different. In your practice, from time to time, do amendments to records occur? Yes. Uh, is this, you looked at Plaintiff's Exhibit 3 and Plaintiff's Exhibit 9. If you go to Plaintiff's Exhibit 3 on page 11, um, is there an indication that an amendment had been made to that record? Yes. Could that be the reason why those records are not the same? Don't answer Objection. yet. Objection, Your Honor. He testified on cross. He had, didn't have an explanation. Okay. Overruled. You can answer. That's a potential explanation, particularly because I believe Plaintiff's Exhibit 9 is a production uh, from an insurance company. I don't know when their documents were produced from my practice, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Now, you also talked about prepayment for services. You, before you even go there, you listed a bunch of degrees that you had. Were those degrees free? No. You had to pay for all of those? Yes. And through your practice, is that how you pay for your degrees? Well, I would say the overhead is the predominant driving force. Uh, the medical equipment is very expensive. We have a, a surgical center with a lot of payroll and uh, the overhead is the predominant uh, concern um, in determining uh, the financial viability of any practice. So in order to stay in business, you have to charge for your services. Is that correct? Correct. Now, what's the typical overhead and I guess you can't go to, and maybe you can, an individual surgery. Do you know the overhead for each individual surgery? Or could you just give us an overall perspective of how much it costs to operate a surgery center? We have two surgery centers. So the overhead is somewhere between five to $10 million a year. Per center or across both? Aggregate. Okay. Now, although... You made some time to come here today, and because of that, did you have to neglect or provide services to certain clients? Uh, thankfully, we were able to rearrange the schedule to accommodate this, so I did not have to cancel any procedures. Um, there, uh, uh, we were able to work with the schedule uh, because it was relatively light this afternoon. And because you're being paid to be here and you are being paid to perform this surgery, do you recall the cost for the percutaneous disectomy? I don't recall, um, but I do want to add that the testimony charge would have been the rate if a defense attorney had asked me to testify versus a plaintiff's attorney. There's no difference. So you do testify for defense attorneys as well? Uh, they may sometimes request my testimony. And I am going to send you to that plaintiff's exhibit three. Um, and then if you go to page number two, there is a charge of $227,624.20. Is, is that the standard charge you charge for the procedure you provided on Mr. Chia? 
Uh, it's broken down because he had multiple levels for both the neck and the back, but uh, this would be the bill, and I have no reason to dispute that that's the bill. Okay. And that's inclusive of the surgical facility as well. And we talked about a little about prepayment. Um, you stated that you didn't know if, if it was still owed. At the time you provided these services, Mr. Chia owed this amount, correct? Correct. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Dr. Any recross? Very quickly, though. Doctor, I don't want this to get lost because uh, we've been talking for a little bit here. Uh, you were asked on redirect about whether or not there could have been alterations to the records as an explanation as to why one record says one thing and another record says another thing from your practice. Is that correct? I believe the word was used amendment, not amendment. Alteration. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, is that correct? That was the line of question you recall of redirect? Yes. All right. And doctor, just to be clear, plaintiff's exhibit number nine, and that's the record for progressive date, the certification May 8th, 2022, has with it a copy of the demand because the council January 8th, 2021. Do you see that? Yes. All right. And that references the August 25th, 2020 accident. Does it not? Yes. All right. And that demand came with a copy of the records from your office. I'll represent that to you. And that came, and these records came from Progressive. Place exhibit number three, which we just talked about was introduced by plaintiff's counsel with a date of June 17th, 2020, a few days ago, 2022, excuse me. Uh, a few days ago. And that record on page seven, uh, page seven shows that the onset was May 20, 2020 in contrast to the record and progressive, does it not? Can you clarify your question or repeat it? Sure. The records in place exhibit number nine shows that the onset of injury is August 2020. The record plans exhibit three, three shows onset May 2020. Uh, I would state that's an inaccurate statement. The records that were produced by progressive state neck pain due to previous MVA five slash 2020 exacerbated recently by rear end MVA August 26th, 20. So it's an injury, injury of neck, same page, offset August 26, 2020. Then you read on for the rest, correct? So the date of May 2020 is in both records. I want to make I'm saying that it's clear. in both records, but the records are different. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And one says the offset is August 2020, correct? No. With the exacerbation. I'm sorry. It doesn't say offset August 2020? No. Does not say that. I'm looking at it right in front of me. No, okay. it doesn't say that. Neck pain due to previous MVA 5 2020 exacerbated recently by rear end MVA. Uh, there is a date field that says August 26, 2020 onset, but it says right afterwards neck pain due to previous MVA. 5 slash 2020 exacerbated recently by rear end MVA, August 26, 20. That's all I wanted, doctor. Thank you. That's it. That's it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions for Dr. Pupala? If so, you know the routine. Jot them down on cards. Not seeing anyone reaching for cards. Okay. Doctor, thank you for being here. Appreciate you rearranging your schedule so that you could testify in this important case. You are free. You are free to go. Ladies and gentlemen, we are done. You are done for the day. I need to talk with the lawyers about some things. Um, my drug court session tomorrow morning is going to be shorter than I thought. So I'm going to ask you all to be here at noon rather than one bonus hour. 
these folks are going to come earlier because we have some things we need to talk about. Um, but uh, let's aim to have you all here by noon. How many of you took the shuttle from the red lot or yellow lot or wherever it is you park? Um, it runs less frequently in the middle of the day, um, early and late. It's, I think, every 15 minutes. So if you cruise in close to starting time, you'll make it here. But in the middle of the day, I think it's every half hour. So if you roll in at 11.58 thinking I'm going to catch that shuttle, I don't know when the next one will be. My guess is it's on the hour, but you'll be late if you get to that lot um, right at noon. Um, so just factor that in. Please have had lunch or brunch or whatever you want to call it, because we aren't going to meet at noon. And then I say, go have lunch for an hour. We're going to at noon take up um, whatever's next from these lawyers. So please have dined in whatever way you want midday. Um, and we'll try to go as late as we can. If you can stay till six, that's great. If we need to go that far, I'm going to talk to these lawyers about how much more they expect. And I'll tell you that first thing when we get started um, at noon tomorrow. Does anyone, don't go to the seventh floor, come here straight. Uh, does anyone have any logistical questions before I let you go? All right, what are you, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple things. One, I'm sorry you didn't get an email. We must have had the wrong email address. So if you give us an email address, we can send the email that went out on Friday that had all the details. I'm impressed you found the place without it. Um, two, um, we can get you a letter every day, but three, at the end of your service, tomorrow, maybe Thursday early, um, everyone gets a letter that says, you've been here for all these days. And that's usually what's most helpful because then you're not having this, well, here's my letter for today and for tomorrow. I promise you, uh, we do them for everyone. Some of you may just want to frame it or throw it away, but um, there will be a letter for each of the 13 of you saying, hey, from Friday through Wednesday, Thursday, whenever we stop, you've been stuck in court. You got a problem, call McBurney and they'll let me know and I'll let them know that you were doing what you needed to do and they need to be accommodative of that. Will that work if you get it at the end or do you need something in between? Okay, great. If they can't, that's all right. Let me know and we'll get you an email or we'll do an interim letter. All right, any other logistical questions? What are the two things we don't do tonight? Talk about the case with others, even pets. You never know what they'll do in response and no outside research. You've mastered the questions. Good questions. Um, do it that way. Don't go online to look up. What's the term? Something disectomy. Percutaneous disectomy. Percutaneous disectomy. You had a chance to ask this doctor about it and you didn't. And that's fine. Don't look it up online. Thank you all for your day. I'm sorry for the late start. I did a bad job of time management. That's not on these lawyers. We'll see you at noon tomorrow. You just come on up to this courtroom and go to the jury room and we'll be ready for you. Thank you so much. All right, you all can be seated. A um, few things I wanna cover. One, we had a sidebar um, during Dr. Pupala's, another sidebar during his testimony. Um, it was as we finished cross-examination, Mr. Huntley wisely um, suggested that we talk outside the presence of the jury about whether the defense had opened the door to a discussion about causation. Um, Mr. Huntley had a different recollection of the cross-examination than I did. Um, my ruling was that Mr. Williams had not elicited testimony from Dr. Pupala about causation, about which accident caused more harm, which if any accident caused harm. I don't think this jury has heard testimony and other than as a document whizzed by, and I don't think they saw it, have they seen anything that talks about causation? Um, other than, of course, Mr. Chia saying, I didn't hurt, then there was an accident, and I did hurt, which is causation testimony, but it's not from Dr. Pupala, which was the prophylactic wall I was trying to build. And I think we maintain that as a group. So um, I concluded that Mr. Um, uh, 
Huntley was not free to explore on redirect with Dr. Kupala anything about causation, and, and he abided by that ruling. Anything you want to get on the record to expand upon our um, sidebar we had? That, that's an accurate reflection of the discussion, and I didn't have any further objections. Okay. Anything you want to add to that, Mr. Williams? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, then uh, we've got a couple things we need to, well, logistically, are you calling any more witnesses? That was the plaintiff's last witness. Okay. So when we start in the morning, noonish, I guess, when we start at noon, I'll ask you, do you have any more witnesses to call? You'll say plaintiff rests. That's what I'll say. Okay. Um, it can always change. Um, what I'd like to do, we can do it tomorrow morning. You all are going to get here at 11 tomorrow. Um, I'd like to handle if there are any motions for directed verdict. We'll do that before we bring the jury in um, because either I'll thank them for their service if I grant a directed verdict or um, you'll be able to say plaintiff rests and we can pivot um, right to the defense case. One point, Your Honor, if you don't mind, and I hate to be this guy, I told my paralegal to have another court reporter show up at one o'clock because that's what the court previously represented due to drug court. I don't know. I'm, I've asked my paralegal to just now send an email, see if they can show up at 11 tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, because there was a shift and I was not aware that was coming. So. I wasn't either till I got my um, set of drug court files. And this is the thinnest pile I've ever received. So we're going to have the time. The good news is Ms. Rivers can bridge the gap. Okay. Um, and we'll work through what that handoff looks like. Um, but Ms. Rivers will be plugged into the drug court proceedings. Okay. And so if the court reporter cannot be here at 11, I appreciate you flagging that. And I'm assuming that you actually get one to show up. I sure hope so. Yeah. Um, we will work with Ms. Rivers until your court reporter shows up. Thank you. Ideally before the jury comes out. But if we need to say, oh, look, here comes the court reporter. We'll just pause where we are. Okay. Thank you for flagging that. Um, do you plan on calling any witnesses if there is no directed verdict? Honestly, Your Honor, I have made the decision, so I'll like to reserve till tomorrow to figure that out. At most, to be one. Okay. Be. You'll need to let me know when we're talking at 11 tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the other thing we're going to do in that hour, other than talk about any motions you'd have, either you or Mr. Ham, um, because the plaintiff has effectively rested, just not on the record in front of the jury yet, um, is we need to do our charge conference. So my homework tonight is to finalize the draft. Ms. Niles has already put something together, but I haven't turned to it yet. Um, so um, I will have for you all, it'll be emailed to you, a draft version of the jury charge, and we'll have our charge conference um, in that hour from 11 to noon. So we'll talk about directed verdict. If the defense wants to talk about that, we'll have a charge conference and we'll get the formal final announcement about whether there'll be a defense case. So it's possible if there's no direct verdict, um, we start at noon, any more witnesses, plaintiff rests, defense rests, you guys can start your closings um, and we'll do that. And we'll have the charge ready to go because we will have had our charge conference. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, and then the jury will have all afternoon to work through what they need to work through. If you call Miss Santana, ballpark, how long would the direct exam be? I can't imagine. 30 that. seconds? Yeah. I mean, I, I know judges be a little facetious, but if it's, if it's more than 10 minutes, I'd be shocked. I'd be, I doubt I'm going to get to five minutes. I mean, okay. I, I envision Miss Santana's testimony to include any questions from jurors not exceeding 30 minutes. And that's not me imposing a limit. If it's four hours, it's four hours. But given that fault isn't contested here, it's not. Um, I, I don't I don't see that running very long. I'm just thinking out loud. So we still get the case to the jury, no matter what, um, tomorrow afternoon. Okay. That's good. Um, Mr. Huntley, anything? Oh, last thing. Um, you all, <laughs> packing a lot into the hour, um, need to figure out what you think needs to be redacted from the exhibits um, or what exhibits don't go back with the jury because it's possible there'll be no more evidence for the jury. Um, there's plaintiff rests, you don't call Ms. Santana, the record's closed, but we've got documents, some of which clearly create a lot of heartburn for one side um, and justifiably so, um, but the answer won't be then nothing goes out with the jury. 
if there's a bill that says still do, we need to figure out how we redact that. Um, and then there are the sections of the comprehensive spine documents where causation is discussed. Uh, in that document, I think also in the ICA. Wherever they are, I, I'm, I'm not limiting it in any way. Um, ideally, you all will agree as to what needs to be redacted. Um, but if I need to mediate that dispute, I'll do it. Um, and then you need to figure out the way in which you're going to redact it. I don't think you ended up admitting, Mr. Huntley, the 200 page Aetna set of records. I thought we were adding, and that's what I was trying to avoid missing getting that in because we oh. were going to expand it on that one document. I, I, I wasn't saying, ha ha, I caught you, you didn't admit it. That wasn't my point. Okay. I just couldn't remember if it was to refresh someone's recollection or if it was to admit it. Because if it was simply to refresh, you used it in whatever way you were going to use it. No, it was to admit it. Okay. Um, you'll need to get those in here, a hard copy of them. Um, I'm assuming that any redaction concerns would come more from the plaintiff's side because it's going to talk about gout. And I, mean, I saw all these different things that... Um, Mr. Chia may be working through that are personal and unrelated to this case. So you may decide in consultation with the defense attorneys, yeah, there are these 200 and maybe the value is that if the jurors went through all of it, there'd be no reference to being treated for the accident in 2013. You'll decide if, if it's worth figuring out what's going to be redacted or not. But what I don't want us to do is um, we charge the jury and they can't start the deliberations for two hours because you guys going through page by page and hope oh, there's his social security number that needs to be done um, as far in advance of getting them the case as possible. Sounds okay. Good, yeah. All right. That's all I've got. Uh, Mr. Huntley, what do you have? I don't have anything, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Williams. That's all I have, Your Honor. Chan. Nothing, Your Honor. Good as always. You've been the easiest customer here. He's, he's been on vacation. So, um, <laughs> nope, he's been paying attention. Um, You'll let us know, Mr. Williams, about court reporter, but if we need to bridge the two-hour gap, Ms. Rivers is here, um, assuming she's compensated. Um, you guys will work on redacting exhibits, and I will work on the jury charge. Um, please be here by 11. I suspect drug court will be done well before then. If it's not, you can watch a little bit of drug court, and then we will transition into Chia versus Santana. Thank you all. Thank you, Arthur. Got four off the worker. How, how did your son do in the baseball game? Um, yesterday was better than today. Okay. 15 to four to the chili dogs. Okay. Um, so they're done because they were in the win or go home phase of the tournament, but they went deep into it. They had a good time. Better yet, the team went to Whitewater afterwards because what the heck, they were done at 10 in the morning. Yeah. It was an 8 a.m. game. And East Cobb baseball is here. Whitewater is here. It's on the way home. And so the coach said, let's just do that. So the answer is my son had a great day. Just the first two hours were not as good. I wish I could just be done in the morning. It's like, I'm just going to go to Whitewater. Yeah, I wish exactly. that was my life. <laughs> well, you chose a different profession than 11-year-old baseball player. I did. I chose law. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. I was just curious. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I can't. Really, I, after the 